I'd like to go ahead and call to order our Brawley City Council and Successor Agency to the Brawley Community Redevelopment Agency of our special meeting today, Tuesday, May 19th at 4 p.m. at our City Council Chambers located here at 383 Main Street in Brawley. I'd like to have a uh, roll call, please. Will all council members present. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and stand for the. Um, and actually, in in place of an invocation, I'd like to um, have a moment of silence for our fire captain da Danny Bonias, who recently passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just like to extend our condolences to his coworkers, his family, his friends, and everyone. It was a, a sudden, um, it, we, it was an unexpected death, and we all feel very, very much for the family and everyone. Thank you. Okay, we go ahead and go to our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Councilman Wharton, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to the approval of the agenda. Second. Okay, moved by Councilman Couchman and seconded by Councilman Wharton. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Okay, item two on the agenda is public appearances and comments not to exceed four minutes. This is a time for the public to address the council on any item not appearing on the agenda that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Uh, since we are currently having a non, pretty much a non-public meeting, we did receive a letter uh, from Kathy Sullivan that wanted us to introduce her letter under this section of the public comments. I will not read the letter, it's pretty lengthy, but it's in regards to a request that she has made regarding a subdivision of her property on Best Road. And the letter will be um, submitted to our city manager, our attorney, and the rest of the city council for review. And uh, she can expect a response uh, probably from our city attorney. Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. Okay, moving on to item three, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Okay, motion by George, Councilman George and Nava, and seconded by Councilman Sam Couchman. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on to regular business. Item 4A, discussion and potential action to approve the agreement for consulting services between the City of Brawley and Castaneda and Associates for SB2 planning grant in an amount not to exceed $160,000. The backup on this item is on pages 58 through 103. And we have our Representative Gordon Gase to report on that. Thank you, Gordon. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Gordon Gase, Development Services Director. Uh, if you recall, I believe it was back in November when you passed the resolution to apply for this grant. Uh, we were successful in getting it. Uh, we will probably be starting work on this uh, next month. Uh, Ralph Castaneda. Uh, is one of our on-call consultants. 
very familiar with uh, HCD. He actually does trainings for them. He, uh, he knows it back, backwards and forwards. Uh, and he was the one who also uh, was the consultant the last time we updated our housing element. So he has a history uh, with the city also. Uh, just as another note that we will be applying for, this, this uh, grant pays only for certain portions of the housing element. Uh, we're trying to get another grant that will pay for the actual body of the element. Um, that one will probably require a resolution to and should be coming forward to you uh, within the next couple of meetings. I believe the deadline on that is the end of June. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Does council have any questions for uh, Mr. Gaist? Mm -hmm. I make a motion that we approve the agreement for consulting services between the City of Raleigh and Castaneda and Associates for an SB2 planning grant in an amount not to exceed $160,000. I'll second the motion. Okay, motion by Councilman Couchman and seconded by Councilman Nava. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, a quick note there. In this grant and the future grant we're applying for, uh, some of that money that's in the grant is actually reimbursable for staff time to work on these things. Mm -hmm. So we'll help out a little bit. Okay, moving on to item 4B, update on the City of Raleigh declaration of local emergency as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. And we have our newly appointed Fire Chief Mike York to give us a presentation on the overall outlook. And I'd like to formally congratulate our newly appointed Chief since we didn't, hadn't done it in person. Congratulations. Did you have any words uh, for that? I uh, <laughs> just want to thank you very much, Madam Mayor, members of the council for the opportunity. Uh, moving forward, the update of our declaration of emergency. Uh, first, I would like to go over the um, numbers as we stand within our area. Um, as of this morning, we were reported to have tested uh, 5,726 persons in our county with a total of 876 positive results. 529 of those can remain active. The, those are either patients within a hospital or treating at home. Uh, we have uh, 332 persons have recovered within our area. We've unfortunately had 15 deaths. And as it relates to the 92227 area code, we've had a 172 uh, positive cases with no breakdowns as to active recovery or deaths within there. Um, because it's such a big portion of our community, uh, our, our numbers across the border within the area of Mexicali is reported at 1,407 positive cases, 127 deaths, unfortunately. Uh, during this morning's operational area EOC briefing, uh, our liaison from the city of Mexicali uh, stated that they are uh, making a request for PPE and other treatment equipment, um, that they're in some pretty dire circumstances. Um, as many of you may have heard through some of the morning information, our operational area hospitals, Pioneers Memorial and El Centro Regional have been reported that they are at near or above capacity. Uh, in response, the county operation area has requested a strike team of ambulances, that's five ambulances from out of the county to assist with um, transporting those, uh, any additional patients or uh, critical patients to areas outside of our county that are appropriate and available. As for our city, we continue to maintain our operations, uh, trying to um, adjust our operations to the guidelines and project what our needs are in the future in regards to equipment, personnel, and um, personal protective equipment. If there are any questions, I will do my best any to answer. Any questions from council? I have one question. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, just a question about Captain Benias's funeral. Yes, sir. And how, if we plan to attend, I think there's going to be like a lineup of things on Western Avenue, and I don't think we're going to be allowed into the cemetery. 
Uh, I don't know what kind of information you have on that or what would be best for us as city council people if we had planned to attend that funeral, how should we stage? Um, unfortunately, the details concerning Cabanillas' funeral are very fluid, even at this late point. Uh, tomorrow evening is his viewing at Fry Chapel from 6 to 9 p.m., and that will be limited attendance as well. Um, the details concerning the funeral services on Thursday morning, uh, at this point, they are going to be very limited to a small number of family personnel only. Um, and our normal response of a procession or any sort of formation is being greatly abbreviated or eliminated. And I will provide information once we have anything solid uh, through um, city manager. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to the guidelines that we are all facing right now, participation is going to be very limited. Okay, so you'll let us know. Yes, sir. Um. Any other questions from council? Mm -hmm. um, uh, along with the briefing, I'd like to introduce uh, Supervisor Ryan Kelly, I believe is Yes, we have him on our agenda. Yes, He's up next. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chief. Welcome. Okay, now I'd like to uh, introduce our County of Imperial uh, Supervisor Ryan Kelly. He's going to give us an, an update also. Welcome. Nice to see everybody in person, mm -hmm. even though we don't look quite <laughs> the same with the mask. <laughs> Madam Mayor, City Council, uh, as um, Fire Chief York mentioned, you have a, a, a very good person. You've made selection as your Fire Chief, a very honest yes. and uh, forthright individual. So Thank you. Okay. It's not because I worked with him or helped train him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a good guy. I think you worked together for a while, right? We did, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, in regards to some of the information, uh, Mr. York shared. Um, there was some information that was uh, put out into the public sphere this morning that that Pioneers was not accepting. Uh, that was not true at the time. And uh, I just wanted to make you aware that there was capacity at the hospital. Uh, so your local is still has uh, available capacity to take. There has been an influx of patients. And uh, there are resources being uh, brought into Imperial County. So as um, Chief York mentioned, there's an ambulance strike team being delivered. But additionally, there is uh, staffing that is coming from uh, California and the federal government to help assist in coverage with patients in both facilities and uh, other resources to be announced very soon. So uh, there is uh, there is a uptick in the amount of patients seeking care at both facilities, and uh, that's relative to something that we were seeing stable for the last couple of weeks. Um, over the last three days, though, you've seen a, a little bit of a rise, and then especially today, <coughs> or, or overnight and into this morning. Uh, I want to let you know that we had a conversation at the county board today about the roadmap to recovery. The health officer and the health director made a presentation to the board about our status of being able to submit to the governor uh, to reopen and go to the uh, enhanced stage two. Uh, currently, the, the metrics changed yesterday for uh, two key things about hospitalization and death. Those were changed. So now it's about testing and over a seven day period of how many you have hospitalized or on one single day, do you have less than 20 per 10,000 or 100,000 hospitalized? So at this point, neither one of those two are um, within the measurement in Imperial County. But what I can tell you is that the entire plan has been completed and is waiting to be able to show that we are uh, within the allowance of those two pieces and submit to the state. Once that happens, the state health director, health officer, and 
our local health officer will have a communication about that plan and it will either be accepted or denied. Um, if it meets all of the measurements, then it will be accepted and we will be able to move. The county board has agreed to have a special meeting. Once we have met that criteria and that we will submit it post haste. Um, the entire conversation of what is presentation by the health department and the health officer will be available and it will be disseminated to all jurisdictions. It will be on our Facebook page, it will be on our website so that you can see it firsthand of what is actually happening in the county of Imperial. Um, and I'm here for any other questions that you may have. Yes, go ahead, uh, Council Manoa. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, listen, with respect to the announcement that was made earlier today about the hospitals um, uh, sending COVID patients outside of the area, right? I think I'm answering my own question, but I want to ask you, at some point, obviously, if we're not receiving those COVID cases, our numbers will start to fall, right? I mean, so if, if they are, if we send them out of county for, for more care, then uh, that day that they reported, they were in our facility, oh, I right? See. Okay. The next day, if they're not occupying a bed, uh, then it would not count, uh, right? But if we fill it up again, so yeah, over, right. yeah. It's being backfilled by somebody else, right? So yeah. it's an aggregate of seven days uh -huh. of what that percentage change is and then what it is averaged over the seven days. So as of Friday, under the new metrics, we would have been okay to submit. But we were under the old one, and uh, we had an uptick in uh, people weekend. seeking yeah. care. Yes. Uh -huh. Understood. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, Councilman uh, Ward. Madam Mayor, yeah, and um, taking advantage while our supervisor is here. Just county perspective also on um, it, with, with the adjustment in these metrics and whether we, you know, hit that soon or not. I, I know that remains to be seen, but um, it is just maybe for the public's benefit because we, all of us are getting asked these questions, right, uh, multiple times a day. Um, with all the um, stay-at-home order, the adherence to guidelines, um, you know, what, we, what the state is deemed as essential business, what, what, can you help us understand what's different today? We've been, you know, so 60 days roughly of adhering to these guidelines, what's to say it's going to be any different two weeks from now, a week from now? I know we're kind of lowering some of the thresholds, but really is, 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 is what we're doing, is there a belief that it is truly May, I, I know it makes a difference, but is it the only answer? And, and I guess that's that careful balance of at what point where, you know, we're trying to balance obviously our, our fragile economy that we have locally here against um, what we certainly trust is, you know, data, but at the same time, it's changing day by day all across the country, right? So I guess my, my question is just what's going to be different? whether it's a week from now, two weeks from now, whether we met that, um, the hospitalization threshold or, or, you know, death rate. Is there a belief amongst uh, the, the county on at what point we, we feel confident we're going to hit this, we're going to be able to move on and move to the next step? So, so Council Member Warden is, um, it, I feel the same pressures you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, um, we, were, we were all in, right? We, we knew very little about what the mortality rate was going to be. We were hearing two to four percent. That was early March. Mm -hmm. And we've known uh, or we've learned a lot more early May. And, uh, and there are, everyone has been fantastic about, uh, you know, adhering and, and practicing social distance, washing hands, co facial coverings, mm -hmm. um, and protecting each other as a community, a neighbor. But, uh, there is a point where the pain and the frustration and the fatigue has set in. Mm -hmm. So some of the influencing factors that we see are um, there have been breaks of social distancing. So during Easter, there, you saw seven to 10 days afterwards, there was a, a rise. Mm -hmm. And then Mother's Day, we're seeing a little bit of that. There's also something that's outside of our control, and that is uh, Mexicali. 
So there is a large population of resident aliens and U.S. citizens that live in Mexicali. And as Chief York mentioned, uh, the services in Mexicali are stressed. And they are being referred if you have the ability to go seek care in America, if you have the opportunity. We're seeing that at the Border Patrol and from Customs. They are reporting that the volume of border traffic has increased significantly. <laughs> and it, it is uh, resident aliens and citizens that are coming back for whatever purpose. <laughs> um, but that percentage, that adds to a population of 180,000, and now we are uh, having to deal with that. Now, the demographics of who is in the hospitals and who's testing positive, it, it's very hard because of the way that post office boxes and physical addresses are used and listed. Mm -hmm. But these are American citizens that are coming back to seek care. And it is, uh, a, we are in a kind of a special circumstance of having an international border, a border with another state that has opened up mm -hmm. and uh, did so last Friday. And we are um, the highest rate of uh, new testing per capita in the state of California right now. But that is also due to the limitation of testing capacity in this county. Initially, we were only testing people that were hospitalized and met criteria. Then it was expanded to those that were um, exposed. Mm -hmm. And the contact tracing identified that they needed to be tested. And then it expanded and expanded. And now anybody, it, if Mr. Hamby wants to go get tested, there's <laughs> nothing preventing him from going to get tested. He doesn't have to see a provider. I've, I did it a week ago, my mm -hmm. whole family. And we got our results in a couple of days. And I'm negative, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I still have a, a, a loose wing nut upstairs <laughs> from the scratch of that swab. <laughs> um, oh, I know. But <laughs> the, that availability is there, and everybody should uh, take use of it. We have a, a state vendor that is offering testing at the fairgrounds right now. They're going to be here for two months. We're hopefully going to expand that to another location so that we can have 264 tests a day out of that vendor. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise than that, they will move to Colexico and to Brawley to do testing. Mm -hmm. So your providers are offering it, your clinics, your hospitals, uh, pharmacies are starting to offer it. That is an important piece because the testing, as we get more and more people that are uh, negative, then that helps us also on our mm -hmm. uh, being able to submit for reopening. And then level three, uh, what you've seen in the last two weeks, uh, and, and you're well aware, is that the criteria has been changing constantly. So the governor about two weeks ago Monday came out with, after the, the beach uh, incident in Orange County and came out with a plan. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you that the county was already working on a roadmap a week before that, and I had been part of it. We were trying to get hope out into our community about how we were going to be able to reopen. And so we're continuing to do that. Mm -hmm. There's more that we're trying to do about like open air eating, um, congregations being able to meet in open spaces. Uh, there, there's just some things that can give people a little relief. So we're hoping. And if it just goes to you money, does it all? Uh, <laughs> Arizona is pretty much open. Yeah. And that's maybe bad or good, but that's the decision I think they've made as a state. And it's interesting over there. Vegas is open. I've like been in San same. Diego too, so I had to go up the script. So, so I kind of know what's going on around there too. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I did get a call today from a gentleman. He said he's going to close his business. Uh, he cannot exist anymore with the length of time. And he's just going to go out and do it by doing it underground. And so, I told him I don't advise that, but I. But I can't tell him no, you know, so I mean, he can do what he wants under the circumstances. But I think we're going to see a lot more of that if this goes on more than another 30 days. So, right. I mean, it's something to keep in mind. I realize everybody's health is very important. But I also realize that most of these small, tiny businesses that can't reopen are not going to be able to survive. Right. And so I hope that we're proactive about this. And I don't know what we do about the Mexicali situation. I think that's going to continue to 
affect us just as air pollution from there does, just as the other things, uh, population growth over there does, air, water pollution, everything else that affects us from that side of the border. Uh, we don't have much choice because we all live there. True. And I know Mayor Hadegi was in attendance with the Homeland Security when they mm -hmm. came here. And their, um, their comments to us were, uh, they were kind of cold water, but they were also common sense. Um, so there's a border. We share it. And uh, you're not going to close it. No, that doesn't look like it. <laughs> and they're not going to staff it either. They're well, not well, we're, it. we're hoping that that's going to change. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> Hmm. Right, they are still at uh, five um, lanes and, and they need to expand and open back up because of the volume that they're seeing. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. And, and I know I got complaints with respect to, you know, farm labor that comes through. Mm -hmm. And so there was uh, obviously concern there. Yeah. It's causing some problems. Some people were in line for five hours. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they're going home, getting home at like four or five, and then getting back in line at 11 just to make it back out here by four or whatever. Yeah. You know, so it's just, it's tough on people. Yeah. Mm. So we, we will send it in as soon as we can meet that measurement. And we want everybody to know, and the, the right information about what's happening today is going to be sent. So as soon as it's available, if it hasn't already been shared with the city manager, I will make sure it's sent mm. so that you all have it and please share it with as many people as you can. We're not talking about COVID, are we? We're talking COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank All you, right. Supervisor Thanks. Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving on on our agenda, we also have a special guest uh, presentation by Dr. Richard Rundhog from the Brawley Elementary School District, Superintendent. Welcome. appreciate the, uh, the invitation. And uh, I think, like so many, we've found this situation to be uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, uh, for the most part, we've stepped up to that challenge. Um, you know, what we keep saying to ourselves is we're having to do things that we've, that we've never done before. Uh, you know, we've never had to educate students outside the schools. And, uh, and that's, that's been an experience. I would uh, uh, liken it to, you know, um, either a child learning how to walk. I think in many ways we've had to learn how to, how to walk again. Um, I think we've stepped up to that challenge. I feel very good about the <clears throat> standards that we've asked of our teachers and that our teachers have agreed to and the process that we've gone through in order to uh, provide students with uh, information uh, in education. Uh, the first handout that I'd like to hand out, if you guys don't mind, and if somebody doesn't want to take it, I won't be offended. I, I understand. Uh, but these are the, uh, the resources that are available to students online. You can just, just hold mine up. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> you can just hold it up so I can Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> and uh, what I appreciate about, uh, you know, what we've developed is this is uh, uh, in grade bands. And so it's very specific uh, to the skill levels that students need. Um, and they're all, they're all online resources. We started off being very concerned about students who didn't have internet access. And so we start off providing packets for those students. And the more we thought about it, we thought, we'll continue to, to provide the packets, but we want to shift the attention of our teachers from uh, providing any assistance on those packets to um, the teachers using the online resources that we've developed. And if a student is unable to use those online resources, then the teacher would provide specialized instruction on the, on the packet versus the other way around. So that was one of the lessons that, that we had to learn. Um, but we needed to collect data at first because we were very concerned about the number of students who did not have internet access. And so the more we uh, collected information, we found out that that number was smaller than, we, than what we expected it to be. And um, we still don't have a precise answer, but I'll, I'll say our estimate right now is that that's anywhere from 
about 400 to, to about 800 students who we believe uh, out of our 4,000 that don't have internet access. So um, we have engaged in some processes that would allow us to, um, to use internet access. Um, we've got access points through our, our, the border link program. Um, not enough, and I'll just say that, so we had to prioritize uh, to whom those access points went to. Uh, the way we prioritized that was, was uh, special ed students. Uh, next, we went to uh, foster and homeless youth. And uh, from there, um, we haven't distributed the rest of them because what we're going to do is we're going to use those in our summer school program. And so our summer school program is going to be uh, completely online. And I'll just share with you some of the, the standards that we're going to uphold in our summer school program. So if I can hand out this document here. So uh, these standards right here are even more robust than what we are able to, you know, uh, come to terms with our with our teachers union. Um, and the reason that we are able to do that in this case is that, um, you know, this is extra money and so forth. So we are able to actually uphold, you know, higher standards than, um, you know, than than just kind of through the normal negotiation process. And so um, I think if the virus continues, we'll try very hard to continue with these kinds of these kinds of standards into the into the fall um, what we're doing right now is we're having a discussion about um, what distance education would look like in the in the fall and the very first thing that we ran into is an in administration was well how many students are we looking at are we looking at a fourth of the students who wouldn't want to come are we looking at half three-fourths you know and so the very first thing that we came to realize as we were having this discussion is that we needed more data. And so as of tomorrow, we're going to be doing, we're going to survey our parents. Uh, we're going to be distributing our packets again tomorrow. And so as parents come to pick up those packets, we're going to be asking that question. Basically, as of today, with the information that you have, um, what are your feelings? Do you want your students to go back to school? Uh, do you expect us to have more of a hybrid program? Or are you set in stone to saying, no, you, you don't want your child to, to return until there's more movement. So with that information, I think we're going to be able to, you know, plan uh, better than, than we would otherwise. Um, and we do believe that we'll see a mix of that. And so the big thing I want to know is what's those, what are those percentages? What are we going to have to plan for? We believe that it's possible that we're going to have to actually assign some, some teachers just to do distance learning and and that's what they're going to do all day long if that ends up being the case I think that would still work to our advantage because in that situation I think what we would do is uh, use those classrooms where a teacher might be working from from home for instance and use those classrooms uh, for social distancing purposes and maybe place those students in the classroom with a classroom aide or something along those lines and then circulate students to come in and receive instruction from their their certified teacher. So those are all options. Um, we're trying to, I'll be honest, we're trying to figure it out right now. Um, but those are some of the variables that we're trying to make work um, as we face the fall. I honestly didn't think we'd have to be making those kinds of considerations as we as we face the fall. But you know, the more I look at data and the more I hear, the more uncertain I am that you know we'll have any certainty as of, as of the fall. And so with that, we're, we're trying to plan for it. Um, like I said, uh, each day it's kind of a learning cycle for us. Uh, at first, you know, we start out with our packets, and then we realized, you know, like I said, that the, the number who didn't have internet wasn't as large as we thought it was, so we changed our focus and said, you know, more internet instruction, and, you know, if we need to, we'll pay a teacher to, to spend extra time going over the packet with a student but focus most of your time to the teachers on, on the internet resources. And then we realized that you know, we've lost some ground. That's the reason we're doing summer school, specifically to just really catch up as much as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, summer school will be 100% online. Uh, and in that case, if a student doesn't have internet access, we've got the means to try to help provide that for the students. And then the next step is, as we look into the fall, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out what to do. But the big answer right there is we need data. We need to know 
you know, how many parents are going to keep their kids at home, how many parents are going to want to send their kids to school and, and plan from there. So we're right in that thrust right now of trying to, trying to plan for the fall. So that's kind of a basic idea of where we're at. Could, could I entertain any additional questions? I just had a one for clarification on the on the students that don't have internet. Uh huh. Uh, and you said they they uh, are given packets. Uh, yeah. So how is that done? Are they the teachers call them? They monitor what they're doing. They, uh, how does that work? Yeah. The, so we created a standard where um, every student, regardless of the forum that they're that they're using, so whether that's internet or paper, mm -hmm. that the uh, teacher would contact the student twice a week. So in some cases, if the student does not have internet access, our expectation is that that student would be called twice a week. And then uh, in our most recent MOU with the uh, uh, beta, which is the Teachers Association, we also created a, an expectation that if the, if the student contacted the teacher, that the student would respond to that, to that help as well. So you could come to the conclusion that there's almost unlimited help that, that the student would need. But so far as being proactive, we're requiring two con contacts per week. And the, the uh, homework or the material is handed in or mailed in, or how, how do they review the work? No, so um, it's distributed. So we put it, uh, we uh, distribute it from the schools so parents can come to the school, pick it up. Mm -hmm. um, after one day of that distribution, we put it at the district office. And we still have, you know, numbers of parents who come by and pick up those paper packets. But the way that it's then gone over with the teachers is essentially over the phone. I see. Um, you know, take a look at page one. How did you do? What were your answers? You know, let's look at page two. Kind of that same routine. So our teachers uh, expressed early on a concern about handling the packets due to the, the virus, mm -hmm. which I, you know, I think mm -hmm. that was a legitimate concern. So that's really the way that they're, that they're, they're handling the packets. Hopefully at, that, at this point, though, that's a, a minimal number of students that are you know, really using the, the packets as their main source. We're, I'm hopeful that the, the vast majority are using online resources where the virus is not an issue. Okay. And as far as the uh, graduation ceremony for the eighth graders, do you have a plan for that already? We do. So we're going to provide a, uh, a virtual uh, environment. And we're going to use yearbook uh, pictures. Uh, if parents have something other than the yearbook picture, uh, they can mail that in. And I think the address, the email address is uh, promotions at, uh, at I'm sorry, uh, BESD.org. -E so it's just promotions. Mm -hmm. um, and so pictures can, or parents can send in a picture. So we're trying to build up some suspense for it. So we're doing teasers with the with the eighth graders, and so we're sending them and their parents emails, and we have a system called Parent Link where, you know, we communicate with our parents and so forth. So we're sending out these messages saying, uh, June second at four o'clock we'll release it, and so we're trying to build some some suspense along those lines so the the kids can anticipate it. And the other thing we're trying to create is an environment where, you know, a family can still kind of gather around the computer and watch the presentation and then it's still a special event for the promoted eighth grader. So we're trying to create that environment still. We realize that it's, it's gonna be a much smaller environment for the student, but at least there's a, a time when that student can be recognized and the family can cheer for them. Okay, thank you. Any uh, other questions from council? Thank, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the um, overview too, very helpful, because of course we get a lot of questions on this as well. Um, what, is there a, is, is there engagement um, with with the state other than um, where we're all getting our information as far as the governor's office, but I mean specific to education? So my, I guess my question is more along the lines of, is every county or every district going to do something different or is there a statewide sort of guideline on, on, on the part of education and our school systems are going to be consistent? We get uh, ongoing uh, information from uh, the uh, the Department of Education, so the California Department mm -hmm. of Education. And then our county superintendent uh, has contacts that uh, he's in contact with often as well. And so um, I would say that uh, Imperial County, though, is probably, I would say, more unified than many other uh, counties in, in the determination of the superintendents to act as in unison as much as possible. Um, and hopefully that was recognized when the schools closed. We all issued a uh, a similar statement uh, and so what we didn't want to do is create a situation where 
Uh, one school district was staying open and the other one was not. And I think that was a very wise choice because, you know, otherwise uh, you get pressures from, from many different uh, places and, and uh, going at it from that perspective, um, it worked, it helped us a lot. That being said is, I, I think the superintendents of the county are in a very similar position about, uh, you know, wanting to reopen, uh, that we want to do it at least on a similar timeline. What we do recognize is that um, we, we may have different standards in exactly how we reopen. I think distance learning is a real good example. Mm -hmm. um, some may offer it, some may not. Mm -hmm. But at least that start date, I think uh, most of us will, will agree upon a start date, or at least agree upon the idea that we'll all start you know, on, the, on this, the day that we planned for. So I think we'll be in agreement on that when mm -hmm. that time comes. What, what we're doing right now is we're talking about trying to create a, a timetable so that we can make some of those decisions. You know, what's, what's the last day that we can wait until we can decide, you know, whether we can make that decision or not. Yeah. My guess is that's going to be in the range of July 15th-ish. Because mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. you have to make a decision at some point, right? And yeah. yeah mm -hmm. so. Right. So that's, that's our work right now is trying to come up with you know, that timetable as to, as to when we need to make those kinds of decisions. How do you, just maybe more of a personal question, I mean, considering we're, we've gone through this, this school year's over, you're going into summer, looks like you've got some plans there for it, you know, maybe your own personal thoughts, and this is just for my own knowledge, how do you see the, the school year coming about this next, this next school year? Well, I, I believe pretty strongly that we're going to have some kind of uh, distance learning model. And, um, and so without question, I, I, I think we have to plan for that, and we are doing that at this point. Um, you know, the big piece is that, that question of how much. But then I think the next part of your question comes down to, you know, will there be a point at which, um, you know, that's declined significantly? Right. And, and I do believe that'll take place. The one thing I believe will change, though, is I believe more parents will be interested in distance learning than they've ever been interested before. Mm -hmm. And so I think our entire paradigm, quite frankly, is gonna shift because all of a sudden we're gonna be catering to what looks very much like homeschooling like we've never done before. Sure, there's also some parents who are like, they don't want distance learning. They're like, get the kids back in school. <laughs> Please don't. Yeah, <laughs> right. so. Exactly. Because it's hard to function, you know? It's really hard to function. Yeah. So I understand, I mean, everybody else has jobs, whatever it is, you know, that they do, it's just hard to function when you're routine, but you got to consider that the kids too, they have their routine, and that is dis disruptive to their learning and their environment and their friends and teachers, and it's just tough all the way around, so I don't, you know, I, I see it as challenging, but thank you for the comments. Sure, and we're, like I said, we're going to try to take that survey, and, and yeah. we're going to do what we can to accommodate right. all, all of those options, to be honest right. with you, if we can. I, I hope that we can, but that's our... That's what we want to shoot for. And I know we're looking at everything, but I also know that schools provide a lot of social services for the students that are here because of low income and other issues that come up. So how do we keep them fed? How do we identify children that have health problems? How do we do all that stuff if they're distance learning, which may not be as, we're not, may not be as capable to do that. So I'm certain that you're probably looking at some avenues there or plans that will have to take place for that to all occur. And, and imagine the implications like with health yeah. where you don't have PE class at the very yeah. least, right? Yeah. Right. And you don't have maybe like a balanced meal there and you don't have a lot of things. I mean, there's a lot of implications for that generation of kids. Mm -hmm. so. uh, have, just, the other thing is the, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to interject there. The other thing is the quality of education. I, my, my worry was uh, it will, it'll probably be a long time before you know like if the quality of education that the kids receive or how educated they at the end of like one full year versus when they were in the, in a classroom environment. Right. So let me answer a, a couple yeah, sorry. of a couple of questions yeah. that came up. But first of all, the social services aspect of it. Um, when this first started out, we were serving we were still serving three thousand meals a day. Uh, we've seen that diminish uh, significantly. I think people are just tired of being in lines and, right. and those kinds of things. Um, but uh, we typically have not served lunch during the summer school. Very often the Boys and Girls Club took that on. Uh, my understanding is they lost their supplier, so we're gonna, we are going to take that on for the time period that we're in, that we're in summer school. My conviction is, is that 
you know, if we're asking students to learn, then we need to take on that responsibility to, to feed them as well, because a hungry student won't learn. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna, we are gonna take that, that aspect on. Um, uh, so far as social services, I'm very proud of um, the people that we have in the uh, um, mental health field. We do employ uh, several uh, therapists and so forth in the, in the school district. They've come together and they've provided a lot of online resources. They maintain contact with students. You know, the one thing that I've learned over and over again out of this process is how, how often our people just step up. Uh, you know, that we got examples of teachers that are just doing magnificent work with, with our students. And some of those students aren't, aren't, you know, missing a beat. I'm not gonna say all of them, but you just hear so many stories. And, and I think our, our mental health professionals are one of them. It's just amazing how they're stepping up and staying in contact with those high fre frequency students and doing everything that they can to make sure that those students are paid attention to, to and so forth. Again, I don't think it's the same quality of what we offer every day, but those folks are doing, they're bending over backwards to make sure those students are, you know, are, are, are being, uh, you know, they're getting the services that they require. I would say the, the hardest thing is definitely the health aspect. There's really no way for us to, and without that daily contact with students and so forth, it's hard to try to monitor those, those health aspects. Uh, I think the bad news on this, uh, Madam Mayor, so far as your question, mm -hmm. um, I think we're gonna have a gap, to, to be honest with you, that I, I have no idea when, when we're gonna fill that gap. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of my conviction on summer school, though. It's like we recognize that there's a gap there. And so, um, you know, we're doing summer school at no cost, uh, and and we're using the computers. We're using everything we can. We're throwing every resource at it, but I think it's going to be years before we before we fill this gap back in. To, mm -hmm. to be very honest with you, and that's uh, that's my biggest concern out of this out of this whole thing. Are you going to be able to offer summer school to everyone that's interested in taking summer school classes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yes. I don't know if you can answer this yet or not, but um, as you move forward toward the fall and, and it, it looks like everything's going to either be distance learning or most of it, um, do you know yet what your plan is going to be for bus drivers? Are you going to have to furlough people or? It's, or a, it's a good question. So what we do know right now is that we're looking at significant uh, cuts from the state. Um, and more than likely, I, I think our, our initial response to that is probably going to be something more along, along the lines of, you know, across the board type, um, type reactions versus uh, uh, trying to eliminate positions. Uh, mm -hmm. We've already, for the data that I have right now shows that I think we're going to eliminate three teaching positions mm -hmm. um, and probably two administrative positions. So we're already in a, in a position where we're, and, and the good news is on those, those were attrition. And I'm sure you guys can appreciate this. Uh, wherever attrition exists, we're gonna you know, think long and hard about um, you know, whether we need to fill the position or not. So that's where we're at right now. We, we, I think we're in a good position where we recognize that early on. And before we started filling positions, we stopped and, and began that, those considerations um, and so I, my belief is that we're probably going to be in, in a, a better position than many other school districts going into this. And so I, I, I feel good about that. But it, we're still going to, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy street by any means. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're looking at it up to, up to a 10% cut is the, the last piece of information that we had. Um, and so that's, that's frightening. My gut tells me in the long run that it's not going to be that you know, because we've already, it started out at a statewide, a $54 billion cut. They've already got it down to an $18 billion cut. And I think the more they work on the, on the budget, it's, it's probably going to get smaller. And that $18 billion represents a 10% decrease. So the more that they bring that down, you know, the smaller that, that decrease is going to be for us. But uh, so we've already, you know, uh, worked on, with the attrition aspect of it. We've looked at what we, you know, what we don't need. Uh, for the most part, uh, we're a pretty lean organization as, as it is, and, uh, and, and then we're driven in, in large part by 
uh, the maximum number of students that we have in a classroom. So, so far as our teaching force goes, it's very hard for us to, to reduce that by contract. So, um, so for the most part, I think we've cut almost, you know, I don't want to say everywhere, but um, we've, we've done some significant cutting already. I think that's the best way to phrase that. Thank you. Okay. Sure thing. Thank you very thank much you. for the presentation. Very good information and well, good luck. You. And I mean, I, I think it's it's amazing that you're able to actually do that for that many students in such a short period of time. It, it was, it's been an experience, and you know, I just have to uh, give a lot of credit to uh, my staff. I've got an incredible staff, and I'll just tell you, here's my feeling on it: is when you compare the standards that we hold, you know, just for instance, contacting students for you know uh, twice a week and uh, giving kind of a grade, any grade, every other week. Um, I think those are some of the highest standards that you'll find in, in the Valley. And so I'm very proud of, you know, that our teachers agreed to that. I'm very proud, you know, that we have the packets and the internet sources. You know, what I shared with you right here in this packet, mm -hmm. that represents, I can't tell you the amount of licensing agreements that had to go in mm -hmm. to, to make that happen. And so I just kind yeah, of have so many students and every, yeah, the users and everything. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to point that back to, and just say I have an incredible staff who works for me. Like I said, we're lean, but you know the fact that that I think we're at least competitive. My personal bias is we're even more than competitive. I think we're delivering a better product than many other school districts. And to be able to do that with a lean a lean staff, I'm just incredibly proud of, of the people who work at, at the school district. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good, thank, sure. you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, departmental reports. Uh, item 5A, update on emergency construction, construction project at the Brawley Water Treatment Plant to replace components of two sedimentation basins and emergency purchase of sewage pumps for lift station one, presented by Public Works Director Guillermo Cias. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Good Council. Evening. Good evening. Regarding this project, the emergency continues. The sedimentation basin rehabilitated continues to produce water as expected. The troughs are expected to arrive on May 21st. The contractor started demolition of basin number two components last Tuesday and continue to do it this week. Contractor will not remove the trough until the new ones arrive. Any question on, on this project? Any questions? No? We're moving forward, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> we expect, we have the expectation of um, the first week of July to complete the project, the, the whole project. Um, it, it is uh, anticipated that uh, we are in the process right now that during the rehabilitation uh, they found one of the uh, bulbs that allows to empty the, the sludge from the pond or to waste, let's say, the sedimentation from the, from the basin, uh, experienced a failure. So it is expected to bring uh, probably the next council meeting a change order for that because uh, we are, it's like uh, repairing a vehicle without, with the flat tire, pretty much. So it's useless because this bulb allows the, the sludge from the pump to be empty and, and to continue the, the process. So, but uh, we are working on it right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, regarding the uh, lift station number one, the emergency, continues on May 4th. Uh, this project moved very quick, so that, that's why I'm providing these uh, dates. May 4th, the pump number one experienced a failure due to a piece of wood stuck in the impeller. May 7th, rain for rain, installed an emergency bypass pump to be ready in case of need. On May 13, the pump number one was removed and replaced by that contractor. Alarm system was tested in case of a failure. On May 14, the pump number two was removed and replaced. The set points were adjusted to the new pump's capabilities. 
The controller panel set points were also, also updated for the new pumps. Both pumps now operate in automatic. Rain for Rent was informed that we no longer need the emergency pump. On May 15, Rain for Rent removed the emergency pump. The lift station is now working as designed and the alarm system is properly set up. This will be the last report of this project due to it is completed. Any questions okay. that you have on, Thank on you. this? Any questions one? from council? One quick question, um, Guillermo. Is there <coughs> is there not a uh, filter or screen system or something that keeps debris like that out of out of the pump? Uh, this project uh, was scheduled during this fiscal year to be completely re, uh, rehabil the lift station completely rehabilitated. <clears throat> However, with all these uh, changes and emergency, we haven't been able to do it. And we had that project includes those type of uh, devices to prevent the access of these um, solids. Mm -hmm. However, we haven't completed, but we had to uh, replace the pumps in an emergency basis due to that. And uh, we are hoping that uh, to initiate the, the full rehabilitation soon but uh, the, the way that is the, the lift station right now is not capable to screen these large solids. Mm. So they shouldn't be there because it is supposed to be coming through the collection system, which is a closed pipe. So it means that somebody threw something on, on a main hole. Okay. So it's not like open to anybody, right? Uh, I mean, it has to be like that mm -hmm. or somebody put it through a, I don't know, um, a sewer lateral, which is not easy to happen, mm -hmm. but unfortunately that happened. Okay. It's uh, the pumps, the new pumps that were installed has a, a device that, that acts like a grinder, mm uh, but that a two by four uh, piece of wood is, is very difficult to destroy right, yeah. even with these uh, devices. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, Guillermo, Thank you. for your report. Okay, moving on to item 5B on our agenda. Um, update on emergency replacement of the three failing air conditioning units at the Brawley Police Department, presented by our interim police chief, Scott Shepard. Good evening, Welcome. Madam Mayor and City Council. Um, so the air conditioners were, they finished installation last week and uh, Oscar Escalani, who is the uh, interim uh, building <laughs> official, he, uh, he was the one that approved the initial uh, bid to make sure that it had the information in there. And, and he came today at noon to inspect the work of the project and he has several questions. So he's gonna set up a meeting with a contractor and get, get these things ironed out and I'll be able to give you an update at the, at the next meeting. Okay. Ready? But they're all blowing really cold air, so everything's good. So it looks so like far. they're working then. Yeah, yeah. Everything looks <laughs> good. Yeah, so just a couple of minor things. That okay. Wants. Clean, cool, <laughs> clean, cool air. Clean, cool air. Okay. Any questions from council? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's cool. Okay. Moving on to item six on our agenda: informational reports, uh, correspondence from local IV agencies to State Governor Gavin. Newsom regarding the COVID-19 uh, resilience roadmap flexibility. Uh, backup is on pages 104 to 105. Rosanna? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor kastner Howdy. So included in the backup on page 104 is a copy of the letter that all mayors of the Valley and uh, the chair of the Board of Supervisors submitted on behalf of the region. And as reported a little bit earlier uh, in the meeting, uh, the message was uh, successfully transmitted and received, and we have seen the metric related to fatalities uh, altered. So now the, the uh, manner in which that item um, will serve as a, a milestone for the area, it, it shifted not just a raw count, but a count uh, based on either a percentage over a period of time or a maximum number, um, either metric as applicable. 
So that is um, included in the backup for council's reference. And then the second item found on page 106 is a letter that uh, was submitted on behalf of Pioneer's uh, Memorial Healthcare District. And the intention of that letter was to provide a general community update on the readiness of facilities and some of their COVID-related experiences. We had an, up, uh, an opportunity to update the agenda uh, yesterday and wanted to be sure that uh, information item was given a chance to, to see a little bit more um, public access by being included in the agenda for, for council. So those items are simply noted for the record and certainly available for any community member who wishes to read in the detail. They are posted on, uh, both of those letters are posted on our city website. Okay, thank you, Rosanna. Any questions from council? Just for uh, clarification, and I know uh, Supervisor uh, Kelly mentioned it. So as far as Pioneer Memorial Hospital, they're not at capacity at this time. They're still accepting COVID patients. Is that what he? That said? is what I, I uh, understand him to have reported out uh, at, in today's comments. Okay, thank you. That's not what the IRD press reported this morning, as he indicated, though. So if people don't have that information, mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe maybe some of the discrepancy has been, I, I didn't see it in the Ivy Press, but I saw the Colexico Chronicle ran an already, an, ran a story early this morning that sounded like it was in response to El Centro Regional's live Facebook uh, report out. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, update that Dr. Edward uh, provided, he talked about both facilities. Yes, mm -hmm. he did. So I, it, it's unclear um, whether, it, well, based on tonight's uh, comments, it appears it wasn't necessarily a coordinated message. And uh, I'd be happy to follow up with Mr. Lewis to determine how we might be of assistance in getting that information out to the North End. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Rosanna. <laughs> okay. We're going to go ahead and move on then to our City Council re member reports. And we'll go ahead and start uh, with Councilman Nava. I'll just uh, keep it brief, but I do want to thank all of staff and everyone here uh, for your help through this process. Congratulations again to Fire Chief York on his new role. And, uh, you know, obviously condolences, uh, Captain, for me and his family. And, you know, it's a terrible tragedy, and, and uh, especially during this time where you're not able to really celebrate somebody's life together as friends and family. It's just very difficult. So my condolences, but uh, just want to say those things. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Nava. Uh, Councilman Couchman? Uh, yes, just briefly. Um, city, city staff has been very helpful throughout this whole time period. I want to say thank you to them. I've had to call a few at different times for some assistance with some items. Very helpful very straightforward about giving me the information that, I, that was necessary. I want to thank everybody for that. There haven't been very many activities. Uh, I have had the privilege of traveling out of county, both to Arizona and to San Diego, as some due to necessity and some just due to maybe more curiosity. But uh, I've noticed that everybody's adapting to this in a different way. I do think that ultimately, <coughs> um, and just as a personal observation, I believe that we're going to have to open something up sooner or later. So, and I think it may be a little bit later, but I think if we go much longer, we're going to have some small businesses that are certainly going to fail. Uh, they are already failing. Uh, so we need to we need to keep that in mind as we listen to the governor's uh, instructions, etc. Um, other than that, I think there's a lot of rumors floating around. There's a lot of Facebook items out there. There's a lot of different things out there in the media. I would ask everyone to just take note that. You can't always believe everything you see in the media or in Facebook or on the internet, and you need to kind of try to vet that with some type of authority or somebody that, that really does know, because I get a lot of calls with rumors. Um, so other than that, I don't really have a whole lot to report. I know the city's operating. I know we do have some businesses open, and they seem to be functioning fairly well under the restrictions that we have. I noticed over here, at least in Brawley, a lot of people are wearing masks. A lot of people are adhering to social distancing, so I do know we're attempting to meet the, the state and county requirements. Um, uh, I notice in other areas of the of other areas outside of the county they are not. 
Um, so keep that though in mind that that probably has an impact on us also. So the hospitals are functioning in San Diego area fairly well, I thought. However, some of the ones in North County are laying off staff because they don't have enough patients. So, and then the ones down south, say Chula Vista area, they tell me that they, they have, they're swamped with patients. So they've got some, some issues with geographics there and some of the things that are affected, just as I think we are here, but on a larger scale. So with that said, uh, thank you very much, and that's all I have for. Can you repeat everything you said? I couldn't understand where that mask was. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's kind of bad, huh? Uh, you want to take it off? <laughs> Councilman Warden? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, two things. I just want to uh, take the opportunity to also echo at least my viewpoint um, as, as not just um, here as Brawley City Council, but also a, as a local operator, um, certainly in business. Um, we, we, the, the careful balance, I think, that uh, um, we as a city have taken by following the guidelines and adhering to um, really, in some cases, up to the date, um, up, you know, day-to-day -day, um, information and data that we're given. Um, I, I really want to point out the fact that I think we've 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 really done a um, a good job as a community. But um, we have to look ahead and understand <clears throat> a little bit of common sense here that um, if the larger big box stores are able to operate at least in a um, uh, safe manner by practicing these guidelines. There should not be a reason why um, any of our small businesses, and I mentioned a little bit earlier, these are these are fragile economy. It just, I, I'm my concern is the damage may already be done. Um, so I I know we're kind of, you know, beating on this drum right now, and uh, we're certainly um, going down the path as the letter indicated, and and working with uh, you know the county and working with our fellow cities. But I I do personally want to echo that. Um, this just cannot remain in place um, forever. There, I, I would argue that there's just as much data showing that um, states and areas and regions that have opened and practiced these safety guidelines have been able to maintain um, numbers in some cases that are even better um, than certainly what our state, the state of California, um, has, has, um, has had so far. And again, it's because we're a very diverse state when it comes to density and population, but uh, I just wanted to say that and make sure that uh, our public is, is, uh, understands that the, whether it's myself as a council member or, or us as a complete council, um, we are working and, and staying diligent, working with staff, um, getting this information and advocating um, a balanced approach that keeps us safe, but at the same time um, does not completely lay waste to our, 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 our business community. So, um, with that said, and that's kind of stating maybe in some cases the obvious, I do want to take the opportunity. This is National EMS Week. I know I bring that up every, every year, but maybe now more than ever. Um, and um, Chief, I love the firefighters and I certainly love ours and, and you, but I think um, our, our firefighting community um, is really kind of bears the flag, you know, in our community for that. But also I want the public not to forget um, our ambulance operators and, and drivers, which certainly in Imperial County and here in, in Brawley, um, are, are the ones that transport these patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're very much uh, an integral part of that uh, uh, community. So with EMS Week, all of our frontline um, 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 heroes are really that, that have been facing this virus when a lot of us were staying home and kind of living comfortably inside, safely away from it. We're still out there responding to calls, especially, can you imagine, in the month of March when it was so unknown of, of, of really where this could go. So um, please, this week, I know we're hearing it a lot, but um, thank our local um, heroes. And I know we do here, um, but uh, you know, keep them in your prayers. Keep their families uh, in, in your prayers and keep them safe. But uh, uh, Chief, on behalf of all of us for National EMS Week, our our, our hats are off to you, and uh, more than ever, we appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, happy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, as as every council member here has done over the last few weeks, we've um, you know met with and talked with um, residents of Raleigh that are you know that are understandably um, fearful and afraid of of what it's, this uh, virus is doing to our economy. 
um, as well as what it's doing, you know, to people who are getting sick from it and dying from it. Um, and there's just so much uncertainty around both, um, you know, the, the how widespread the virus is, but also, um, you know, every day the numbers change or, or we, we take a step forward and then two steps back. And mm -hmm. it's, it's very disheartening, I think, to a lot of people. And, and I think uh, people's mental health is, is uh, suffering some from that. Um, but I do see um, a silver lining in that a lot of people are able to spend more time with their families that, that they weren't able to before um, with all the busyness in our lives, myself included. Um, but yes, as, as other council members have pointed out, uh, we are quickly hitting a wall <clears throat> in our community where we, we either won't recover economically or it will take a very long time to do that. And, and looking nationally even <clears throat> at some larger uh, businesses, restaurants, um, retail stores that are, that are shutting down that, that probably would have survived another couple of years at least. Um, so it is very, uh, it's a scary time. So as, as Donnie said, I think we need to do everything in our power to advocate for the businesses in our town and in our county at the state level to, to uh, allow these to open back up with the, with the proper safety measures in place. As Donnie said, you know, if Walmart, if Home Depot, if Target can be open, um, goodness, there's, there's no reason why some of these smaller mom and pop stores that have goods to sell can't abide by the same safety measures and, and be in operation. Um, beyond that, you know, we've all been attending different kinds of Zoom meetings and um, I've, of course, with the council uh, as, as well as with the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the County Health Department been able to attend um, some Zoom meetings. And um, within our neighborhood, we've had, uh, I, I can't even count how many uh, birthday parades we've had. <laughs> um, I've, I've spent a lot of time at the Dollar Tree lately getting uh, poster boards and markers <laughs> and that kind of stuff to decorate cars. Uh, but it has been a time, uh, I think, of coming together within each, each neighborhood in our community. And that has been very um, heartening to see. Um, I, I'm in some ways, I think, uh, participating in community in a way that I wasn't before, or wasn't able to, didn't have the time to. So, uh, you know, in the midst of, of the uncertainty of, of incomes and that kind of stuff, there is some silver lining. And so, um, you know, we can, we can't always look at the negative. We have to sometimes accentuate the positive so that we don't go down that rabbit hole of, of negativity. Um, I've also appreciated the extra collaboration and communication with other council members during this time. Um, I think we've, we have become more cohesive as we've had to um, uh, realize what we're up against for the next couple of years at least and I do want to offer my appreciation to the rest of the council as well as, as others have said, to city staff. There's, there are some things that continue to, to happen, uh, activities and projects that move forward when everything else seems to come to a standstill. Something as simple as, as a complaint from a resident over by the cemetery that you know things are becoming very overgrown and in a very short order that's been taken care of. So um, I appreciate that projects are still being done. And um, I, uh, I just want to let you all know that, that the city, the uh, city staff and council and individual community members are in my prayers for safety and for comfort um, in, in a very difficult time. So that's it for my report. Okay. Mayor. No, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pritam. Um, I think I probably will be sharing about the same sentiments. Um, uh, I think we're in a, in a position where uh, I've been a little stressed, more stressed, because I think the residents, uh, and rightly so, look to us uh, to make the right decisions that are going to affect them in a positive way. And um, unfortunately, our hands are tied in this particular situation when we're dealing with the businesses. Um, I, I, when they call or ask us questions, I already know the answer they want to hear. And unfortunately, we can't give them the answer they want to hear because we're, 
we have to follow the guidelines. Uh, at this point, we have to follow the guidelines uh, uh, with the state and our, and our county health department. And like Sam said, they look at other cities that are close by, like Yuma, and they wonder why they're doing that. And then, um, but you know, so it's been, it's been a, uh, I have to admit, it's been a pretty stressful situation because I haven't been able to to do what I would be would like to tell them or or be able to help them in one way or the other, and unfortunately, um, the the situation with our city and I you know I know it's a lot of cities too that don't have the the revenues to assist a lot of these businesses that we wish we could, you know, help them uh, to stay afloat right now, and I I know we're doing our best we're we're staying on top of all the grant opportunities that are out there. Uh, unfortunately, they're not here now. We don't have the revenues now to assist. Um, I know, I thought that uh, the county, I know, uh, has a program and it wasn't covered. Maybe Rosanna will cover it a little bit more, but um, there is some help out there, but I'm not sure that there's gonna be enough help for all our businesses. And unfortunately, we don't have the help right now for specifically just for our Brawley businesses. So that's really hard uh, for us to, uh, you know, to deal with it. Um, and of course, we have our, our uh, traditional things that Brawley has, and I'm starting to get worried, as I'm sure a lot of you are, about whether or not we're even going to be able to do our, tra our big traditional events like the, the Brawley Cattle Call um, events, the rodeo, and so forth. Uh, um, if you would have asked me a month ago, I would have said, oh, definitely, that's far off. You know, we, can, we for sure are going to be able to do that. But it's starting, I mean, when you hear about the schools and about the fall and about all these uh, things not, you know, changing so drastically, it makes you wonder. I mean, we can still um, obviously hope for the best and, and hope that our economy will, will be able to rebuild our economy and, and will rebound. But it's just, it has been a, um, a very trying period. But um, I do want to, I do appreciate, like oh, the rest of you, I appreciate my co-counsel, I appreciate, because I know you're out there and you're answering a lot of these questions for, for our residents. Even though I don't, I sometimes think about calling you and think just to kind of dump on, on you guys and tell you how I'm feeling, but uh -huh. <laughs> I usually do that with Rosanna instead. But um, I know that all of us are hearing the same, the same things from our, especially from our businesses and a lot of our our, the customers out there, the residents. So um, I'm trying to get used to just doing things a little differently. I have a granddaughter that's graduating and unfortunately she's not gonna do the traditional, um, but we're, we're gonna you know, try like everybody else, we're trying to make the best of things, uh, the best of birthdays, the best of Mother's Day celebrations, the best of Father's Day celebrations that are coming and uh, trying to keep our, our social gatherings to, you know, between five and ten people. Um, I do have to say that I did make a trip to San Diego this week also for medical uh, reasons, and they are um, pretty much operating the same as we are here. I, I, had, I went to, to a hospital and I wasn't permitted. There was a big sign right in front of the door that basically explained if you're here with this or that or whatever, and that this is a you know the you're you're not the patient, pretty much you can't go in. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're the parent or or what. So it, it that makes it even more stressful because if you have a uh, somebody sick in your family, and um, you can't be there for them, you know, makes it really hard. So anyway, I just um, it's just. It's a, a trying period, I think, for all of us. And, um, but I think, you know, I know the county and our public health department and everybody else is working really well together. I think we're, everybody's very cooperative. Um, I know that some like to push buttons, but sometimes maybe it's a good thing to question things, you know, and maybe uh, other things will get done. And I think as a county, we have to keep asking the governor to see if maybe They'll give us some flexibility in making some changes. Um, I'm getting a little worried when I see the news and they say that we're not one of the counties that's qualified to move on to the next phase. And I know that a lot of it has to do with what's happening with what we talked about a little earlier about our proximity to the border. So there's some things that of course we can't control, but um, we just have to keep 
asking and, and see if maybe they'll allow us to move forward a little bit, maybe into the second part of stage two and, and allow some of these businesses to, to start operating again. Okay, and okay. yes, sure. Some of sure. the comments have been shared. Two thoughts came up, and it's one, one I didn't say earlier, but I'm certainly in favor of getting small business up and running. I want to see that open. I want to see people be successful. It's really difficult for people, especially when that's what they rely on for their, for their living, right? It's very, very important that we promote that as much as we can mm -hmm. as a council, as a city. But secondly, if, if there are going to be some restrictions that are minimized and they are able to, to go into business, I think it's our responsibility as a council to be very vocal about that and make sure we start promoting that message, whether it's curbside, um, you know, pickup delivery that they can do, all those sorts of things to let people know and let the public know that, hey, maybe not everything's open, but these types of businesses are open. Mm -hmm. So I think collectively as this council and staff, we need to work on, uh, whether it's a short video or something, I can work on it, I can work with council staff, but we need to get that message out there mm -hmm. because you know, people are still confused. Are they able mm -hmm. to be in business and open You're and right. not doing it on the sly? Or, you know what I mean? It's like, it, I want to be able to promote um, what people can legally do, right? And I think it's, it's important for us to, to get that message out to everybody because I can tell you there's a lot of confusion. People still approach me and call me about what they can and cannot do. And I don't always have the answer, but I think as a council what we can do is certainly um, work within the, the restrictions that are out there, but make sure that we're promoting, you know, things as much as possible for people mm -hmm. to get that message out there, to get their businesses moving. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. if we wait around and we're waiting just for bigger government to give us the tools and the instruction and mm -hmm. the direction, we're going to wait forever. I've always said this, yeah. and it is true. The thing about government, like, you know, people say, oh, why don't you run for a state or whatever? I'm like, I have no interest. <laughs> I like local government because local government is what government is. It starts here and it ends here. That is the truth. There may be federal funds, there may be state funds, but it starts here and it ends here. So it really is our responsibility. It really is. And I just want to get that message out to everybody, especially my fellow council members, that we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to promote our community. And I know we're in a region, there's El Centro, there's Calexico, there's Imperial. But right now, to be quite honest with you, I'm concerned about the city of Rome. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we, we do everything we can for a business. Anyway. Okay. Okay. No, I think that's a, a very good point, George. And you're right, because um, as, as all of you know, if you look on the website and you, and you follow that um, map to, what is it, roadway to recovery, I should have it memorized by now. Um, it can get pretty, it's too lengthy for one, and then to, to try to find exactly what you're looking for. So I agree because uh, some have called me and then I'll, I think I know the answer, but I say, okay, it might have changed. So I have to go look it up and then it takes me a while to actually find the specifics about a particular business, whether or not, in what stage it's at and whether or not it's approved. So I think you have a very valid point that we probably maybe should work on something. And I know where we've been telling people to go to the hub also, but even the hub sometimes doesn't cover a lot of that information. It's just very time consuming for people and a lot of them are not, um, well honestly, they don't use the tools, they don't use Facebook and so they probably do need an, a different resource. But so. what I think it's a good point that you're making is that, for example, the hub is good, it, it has good info, yes. but it's not for everybody, right? right. And, and some of the guidelines that have been handed to us, like I read some of the stuff, it's like yeah. a huge book, I'm like, I'm not gonna read all that. Yeah. Nobody's gonna sit there and read that, you know? And so, even something as simple as just going, shooting a like five minute video, going to a, with going to a bunch of businesses. Hey, this business is open. Hey, this business is. I mean, it could be something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Brawley's open for business. Here's what's open right now. There may be restrictions when they get there, wear a mask, all that stuff. But at least they're open, right? And yeah. That's what I'm getting at. It's like yeah. you need to let people know, like, hey. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, like I said, that is a good a good point, and maybe we can work on something together to get that done. Okay, um, that's all that I had on on my well, only one other thing. Since I did have um, 
somebody here today to talk to me about the census. So it is a, an important reminder um, that we want to encourage everyone to fill out the questionnaire for the census. I think it got lost with the pandemic because that was like our number one priority uh, a few months back uh, when we were talking about all the uh, material that we had and how to promote it and we were going to have uh, uh, kiosks and all kinds of stuff and of course that kind of went by the wayside but uh, the dates have been extended uh, to July the middle of July I believe so we need to still promote that uh, for people to uh, fill out the questionnaire and we all know that it's uh, for funding for schools it I mean education housing health transportation it affects it affects all our, our funding so I, there's a lot of federal funding involved so if you do have the opportunity, uh, please continue to promote it. Make sure that everybody you know has already filled out the questionnaire. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we'll go ahead and move on to city manager report. Rosanna? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, late last night, I was in receipt of a letter uh, from the office of Assemblymember Garcia. I did uh, forward a copy of that document to you. Uh, it is a request of the city to express its support for uh, $28 million in New River uh, improvements, as well as $19.3 million for Salt and Sea management uh, planning efforts. As I understand it, uh, these two activities were included in the May budget, uh, revised budget that was uh, unveiled. And so what Assemblymember Garcia's office is requesting is that the city go on record expressing uh, the prior prioritization of this uh, set of efforts as relevant locally and um, also regionally very uh, significant. So if, if the council is open to it, I uh, would be glad to prepare a letter for the mayor's signature. Um, yes, we could provide that direction. Do we need to vote on it or just provide you with direction? I see everyone in, in agreement about that okay um, it's definitely i mean we still can't lose sight of the fact that the new river and the salt and sea are very important issues in our imperial county so with um, significant air quality related uh concerns for for our area um also wanted to share a, a little factoid uh in a posting earlier today by uh, a local nonprofit, comite civico the uh, data point suggested that imperial county is now at 50 percent response rate which in the last 30 days, it was in the 40 realm. So we, we've made we've some progress like by pushing those messages. And I think every chance that uh, any of us have to encourage people to take the time to complete okay. the sentence, census um, is, is very valuable to, to all of us as residents of Imperial County. The statewide uh, response rate is about 60%. Mm -hmm. So we're not that far <laughs> off and perhaps with a greater push will achieve um, even better results. Uh, also wanted to update the council uh, with information that has been shared electronically and is now up on the hub. It includes the County of Imperials, dedication of $500,000 for a business assistance uh, program that'll be in the form of a low interest uh, or forgiv forgivable loan at $10,000, uh, up to a max of $10,000 uh, per loan. That will be available countywide. And um, the city is in very active discussions with both our county uh, partners, as well as uh, HCD, uh, the State of California Housing and Community Development, Community Development Block Grant Program has set aside funds relative to COVID specific needs mm -hmm. and the city uh, has has begun some very, very active dialogue both with the Ivy Business Recovery Task Force, the Brawley Chamber of Commerce and the county to see how we can complement the offerings for uh, local Brawley based businesses. Mm -hmm. The guidelines are rapidly evolving right now. It's kind of a new age for HCD to work in. Normally their guidelines are extremely uh, uh, d fully <laughs> described, fully uh, defined, um, can sometimes be challenging to, to put those dollars to use. Our hope is that the timing of our local business needs and the timing for funding can um, 
overlay in a way that's valuable to our businesses getting a running start. And happy to work with um, any members of the council that would like to, to kind of shape what that could look like. At this point, it appears to be uh, mostly an effort that would be focused on generating the types of supplies that are needed for local businesses to open their doors mm -hmm. and uh, work within the, the realities of COVID-19. So whether it's using um, disposable face masks, reusable face masks for employees, et cetera. Um, Rosanna, along those lines, um, if say there's a business that has already um, laid out cash for, for supplies like that, um, you know, whether it's for um, barriers between customers and, and cash registers or whatever, um, do you think there might be a way to, to reimburse for stuff like that? Or is this going to be kind of just a purchasing uh, equipment and dropping it off kind of a scenario? So we're not sure how flexible the guidelines will be. Typically, CDBG has very, very rigorous procurement requirements. So the idea of reimbursement isn't typically the format. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is develop a, a scope of a described activity that's as flexible as possible so we can put those dollars to use in the most effective way to the broadest audience. So our goal will be not to paint ourselves into a corner, that this is the only way uh, the, the items can be either purchased or supplied, but rather develop a set of eligible expenses that we can incur with use of those funds that uh, those dollars can, can offset. Okay. So uh, the dollar value that we're currently working um, with is uh, approximately $134,000 is the city's allocation. Now, um, a little earlier this week, I sent a description um, to council some of the other types of activities that perhaps the city uh, might consider use of these funds for, including some very basic measures within three or four city locations that uh, we need to modify as we move forward with opening our doors in the traditional format. So there's some features that, that are suggested that, that might be best practice mm -hmm. in our setting as well. Um, also included were some thoughts on how to supply some of the cool center related dimensions uh, mm -hmm. at outdoor facilities, which is not typically what we've done during this time of year. Mm -hmm. A lot's going to hinge on the timing, if it's going to take 120 days to get access to the supplies, that obviously isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Although we are expecting businesses to have ongoing needs that very likely make their way into the end of mm -hmm. 2020 and possibly. Right, right. What's the timeline, do you know? Like, I mean, is this like a fast track thing? They realize that we're in the midst of this COVID-19 right now. Can it's, they fast track it? it? It's fast track for HCD standards, but okay. um, that's not necessarily um, timed with local um, reopening plans. <laughs> and it would be a good problem to beat them to reopening because we wanted it, you know, as soon as, as, soon right, as possible. Right, right. <laughs> so. So uh, I'll be sharing additional information with you on that front. The city is very likely required to hold a, uh, have a public participation process. So that activity would be coming back to a council meeting in the not so distant future, where we would receive feedback if the, count, if the council or public wish to, to offer um, different possibilities for the funding. So I guess maybe you could just tell them that the council expressed concern about the timeliness of this uh, receiving this as maybe we they could fast track it or I don't know. Yeah, it would What's be happy kind of to. In there? <laughs> We're with um, in excess of 100 communities. Okay, so and I'm it, sure they're all doing the same thing yeah. probably. Yes. Okay. That's all I have to report at this okay. time. Any questions from <coughs> Council for Rosanna? Any questions, other questions? Okay, thank you, thank you Rosanna. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're moving on to city attorney report. Nothing to report, okay. I wanted to see how you sounded with the mask on. Not good. Uh, <laughs> not good. Uh, city clerk? Okay. Let's see, what time do we have? We have 5.35, and then we have the strategic planning um, part of our meeting uh, that's coming up, and then the closed session. Is there a desire to take a break at this time, or? Yeah, five minutes. I need to breathe. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and take we'll go ahead and take a 10 15 minute break. Okay.
Thank you. And reconvene. Yeah, I think we have everybody back, right? Okay. And we're going to go ahead and move on to item number 11 on our agenda. Strategic planning for fiscal year 2020-2021. And Rosanna Moore has the floor. Thank you. So this is the time of year where uh, some of the most critical uh, discussions take place to inform the following year's uh, budget preparation. And I um, want to express my thanks to each of you for uh, joining in person today with the uh, hopes of, of uh, getting some input needed as we move not only through some new times with uh, the types of variables that COVID-19 has in introduced uh, into our landscape, uh, but also uh, with awareness that this fiscal year as well as next is going to experience some changes um, due to COVID-19 that uh, will really frame up how we uh, carry out the next 12 months of financial uh, decision making and hopefully lay the groundwork for a healthier future. So uh, today our hope is to set and prioritize goals. Every year uh, we do a revisit of our mission statement. We also talk through the values that have uh, been expressed by the council as most important. Um, in terms of the way we deliver services. And while the list, uh, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, is uh, varied, as we continue to, to operate in a landscape of uh, constrained resources, the order of those goals becomes all the more important as we uh, do our part as staff to prepare a budget for council's consideration in the future. So this evening, our hope is to get some feedback from you to arrive at some degree of consensus, recognizing that these are not easy topics to weigh in on, and then really lay the groundwork for the 2020-21 uh, overall budget approach. The next two council meetings as scheduled will uh, take in the general fund and enterprise fund, as well as the overall budget presentation. So um, our mission statement, uh, it is to effectively provide the highest quality of municipal services in a manner that values local assets, builds public trust, and advances overall community prosperity. This mission statement guides everything that we do. Our intention is always to raise that bar as high as, as it can be raised uh, to deliver within our, our financial uh, abilities. And uh, you'll see here what have been expressed as our city goals. And I would like to take a moment to, to um, emphasize we have four goals, but I think we all recognize um, that our street-related improvements and public safety as we know it, these are two areas that we uh, devote uh, significant resources to. And while they're expressed as a given, I think in practice, uh, in many ways, they are elevated to a much higher level uh, priority than, than maybe this listing of uh, goals suggests. So as a reminder, uh, we had a, a uh, very delayed budget process last year for a number of reasons. I'm proud to report today that we are on time with our audit for uh, prior year. And uh, in meeting that milestone, we also uh, on schedule provided our mid-year budget review. Since uh, that review was provided, we also did an update based on COVID-19 related impacts that clearly will influence how the last quarter of this fiscal year, 2019-20, will be impacted and how long it might take us to recover. So um, this is very much the landscape in which we're preparing for next bu budget year. In 2017, uh, the ballot included the extension of the utility user tax. It is scheduled to expire in 2022. 2020 is uh, the year 
that if we wish to maintain continuous uh, presence of the utility user tax, the UUT would have to be passed. If it weren't passed, if it weren't pursued as a ballot measure or it wasn't um, actually successful in passing, we would find in May of 2022, the UUT would expire. And uh, you might recall recent action um, at the state level required our, all of our local races to combine with uh, even year elections. So 2020, after 2020, 2022 is the only time at which the utility user tax could be considered. And that action has to be combined with a local election. I uh, want to also just note as a reminder, yes? I'm sorry, Rosanna, so that would have to take place in a, like a March election or it would, it would expire and then be voted on again in November? Uh, in, in the 2020? 2022. 2022. The 2022 horizon, uh, there is actually a gap. The intention was deliberate to place the uh, utility user tax prior to. So if we weren't successful mm -hmm. in time number one, there will definitely be a gap between uh, expiration and potential renewal if a ballot measure were sought in 2022. Mm -hmm. And that would have to occur in the November election. Correct. Right? Because that's the general election. Right. So in other words, the most the seamless scenario is for potential passage this year mm -hmm. on the ballot for continuous um, uh, utility user tax in place. If not, if for whatever reason, or for some reason, if we opted not to put it on the ballot um, and, and, and actually get to 2022, there would be an expiration, there would be a gap in that, and then right. you'd be reapproaching it. So, Would that gap straddle two fiscal years, or would it end at, at the end of June uh, and be reinstated at the beginning of January? It'd, be, it'd depend on the manner in which the, ballot, the new ballot measure in 2022 was framed. I, the, the ability to retroactively collect a utility user tax for a billing period that's already transpired, I don't think is a realistic expectation. Right. I just mean, what, what date does it expire? It's May, May 2022. Okay, the end of May 2022. And <clears throat> if it were, if it didn't pass in 2020 and expired and then happened to be voted back in in the November 22 election, when would it be reinstated? Depends on the language okay. of the ballot measure. So let's say best case, it's December 1st right. or January 1st. The council actually controls, with the help of the city attorney, the language of the ballot measure. Right. And so it, let's say it were on the ballot measure, November, it's approved by the voters, then it would be, once the, the, the vote is official, then, then, yeah, the election department, then we can start okay. legally collecting. Sorry to get off in the weeds. I'm just wondering why uh, why it was set to expire in May instead of, you know, right, right in November. Uh, at the time, the discussion was centered around um, either uh, renewal well in advance so that the city has time to wind down services that it provides. So you know far in advance that it's not going gotcha. to make it. And, and the utility user tax was started long ago. And so really what we have today is just a, uh, an extension of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been extended over years, right? Okay. And so it's not something with, that was framed at like the last election, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So it's just, it's kind of been in place and we've been extending it, extending it, extending it. And, and, and there's been discussion, not heavy discussion, at least since I've been on council, about potentially even doing away with uh, the sunset yeah, clause. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and um, I, I think when we, you know, shift our discussion to that part, it'll be important to talk about. Um, I, I think a lot of people, there, again, there's misinformation also about the utility user tax in terms of how what, exactly what, you know, how it's applied. Obviously, it's importance to the general fund, but the other thing um, is unbeknownst to many is how it, it's one of the only tools, um, really funding tools, that are, are, are still out there for local agencies like ours 
that have virtually have been weaned completely off from the state, right. you know, providing any of that type of assistance mm. with dissolution or redevelopment, et cetera. So um, it'll be important that, you know, we do our homework and, and analysis, but I think everyone's always understood, you know, the value that it provides to the services we provide. It just, again, it comes down to making that case again, you know, and maybe consideration for doing away with the sunset clause. But yeah. Sure. So the utility user tax, when first established, was established by ordinance of the council, and uh, the year it went into effect was 1991. And um, in the early years of its existence, 91, 92, 96, there was no sunset clause. It was originally established at 5%, and then it wound downward. Um, in 1998, it uh, actually landed on a ballot measure, and at that time began the framework of an ending date. So when passed in 1998, it had a, a June 30, 2008 deadline, or sunset. In 2005, it uh, became a, a sunset in June, and in 2011, it had a sunset of May 31st. So that was kind of how it was, it was uh, thought that the better way to be able to uh, forecast service level changes, a little bit more room than um, a, f a fiscal year or a calendar year was helpful. Mm, okay. And there, there's kind of a lot of history to the utility <laughs> user tax, the discussions around weaning, the, the notion of weaning um, the city off of dependents. And I think there's maybe um, positives and negatives to that concept. One is that you're reducing service levels at the same time as a ballot measure has support. So those things sometimes aren't consistent with each other. Um, I think the bottom line is, though, that the city's ability to replace that portion of the pie in, um, from a revenue point of view is, is a, a major challenge no matter what year the utility user tax is undertaken sure. as a ballot measure. Rosanna? Yes. So you said that the history on it was that at first it was implemented as an ordinance? It was an urgency ordinance in 1991. And then what made it necessary to be become part of a elected uh, as a ballot put on um, the ballot? I would not be surprised if it was relative to uh, a requirement by state law that a tax mm -hmm. has to be at the, uh, but I, I would defer to our city attorney to weigh in on that topic. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Maybe it was an art somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. A Prop 218 process? It was pro probably one of the different constitutional measures that's been passed by initiative. That was, of course, way before my time. Oh. But, uh, but somehow that the law required it then at that point. Yeah. Right. At this time, we wouldn't <coughs> be able solely, without a vote of the people, to impose yeah. any tax mm -hmm. on the citizens. Yeah, that's what I was so wondering. So there's not like a temporary uh, crisis, you know, type yeah. ordinance yeah. that it could fall under. That's what I For was those wondering. six months or whatever that it's expired. If it's sunset and then all of a sudden, you know, we found that, that we needed the revenue. You can't even really impose a fee, uh, a, a general fee, without bringing it to the electorate. It's very, very, very mm. difficult. Mm. Okay. 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 Thank you. So um, another bit of, I think, key context to share with you is we did uh, last year go through the MOU renewal process with four of our bargaining units. Three of the four bargaining units uh, we reached agreement with for a two-year merit freeze. The fourth bargaining unit, which is Teamsters, we were unable to reach that agreement. So uh, this fiscal year, we will be sitting down in, in 1920 to discuss what 2021 will look like and obviously as all other groups are experiencing that freeze, um, it is very likely that we would uh, pursue that same arrangement. Um, in general, last year, I'm sure um, it, it was noted by all of council that our reliance on the general fund for capital projects, we do everything we can to try to seek grant funds, try to use special funds and not violate the supplanting um, limitations. It's very, very rare that we're using the general fund for capital projects. 
And so although we've got incredible needs facility-wide, including things like the pool replastering, the Lions Center roof replacement, those types of activities that are um, we couldn't use special funds for, it's really a general fund supported activity or a grant. We're not pursuing those projects. We've done them on a very, very limited basis. And in this fiscal year, the only time we did we, we used those funds or accessed those funds was tied to the console upgrade at our public safety answering point, our dispatch center. And you might recall, we used special funds for the portion that was law enforcement related, but fire could not be uh, their portion of the call volume um, and uh, equipment needs could not be charged to law enforcement special funds. So very limited general fund dollars were devoted to that cause. Uh, we are, uh, obviously this has been the big year for addressing the last three years of exposure relative to the Flores versus San Gabriel case. We are uh, proud to report out to council and the community that we have reached a settlement with the last remaining bargaining unit. We're trying our best uh, to be sure that all of those back wages are actually paid out to our employees before June 30. Just yesterday, a court document was filed by uh, the parties that will uh, govern the payment arrangements. We're hopeful that we might hear from the courts in time to uh, make all those payments before June 30. At this point, it's a function of how long it takes the courts to turn around um, their decision and acknowledge um, those arrangements. And so in the next uh, workshop format, you're gonna hear about the reserve. Our hope would be that by then all payments would be made and what you're seeing as that general fund reserve value reflects where we truly stand, not payments yet remaining. Uh, as shared with you a short while ago, uh, we did have a presentation from our finance director regarding, regarding COVID-19 financial impacts to revenues this fiscal year, along with projections into next year, as well as a portion of the following. So I thought it would be helpful to talk through some of the service changes that we um, pretty dramatically uh, implemented in March, in the March window, as we began to respond to changes from um, the health department's point of view as it relates to allowable activities. So we pretty much placed all community events on hold as a result of congregating not being uh, permitted. This was a downside to organizations um, locally who use these types of community events as key fundraising activities that keep their organizations alive annually. So we've begun to hear some feedback from those parties who um, you know, are, are concerned that next year could, could have a similar restriction that could really harm their ability to continue uh, their organization's work. We moved uh, pretty rapidly along with uh, closures of public buildings. We moved to uh, res heavily restrict access at the main branch and the Del Rio branch libraries. And along with that, we eliminated our part-time uh, staff uh, and temporary staff uh, associated with the library. We do currently have two full-time employees who are performing maintenance duties relative to the collection. Uh, and uh, we also have our director that continues oversight of that uh, department as well as the Parks and Recreation Department. LAMS, which is the mobile uh, book delivery uh, program, they were no longer able to give their presentations and do outreach to various uh, childcare uh, and preschool uh, settings. And so um, those individuals uh, have been part of staff reductions for now uh, with those facility closures. Can I ask a question on that? Uh, yes. And it's hard to tell. I know it is. But is there any plan moving forward, um, especially with that funding source uh, for, for LAMS, the LAMS project? Is there any idea of how that's going to look in three months, four months? 
They have expressed um, great support for ongoing, um, supporting ongoing operations. The duration um, is less clear. If this were to go on, let's say, for a six-month period or greater, it's uncertain how they might mo modify their willingness to reimburse the city. But for now, we're not incurring costs with our LAMS-based uh, employees because they, they were essentially sent home. Oh, okay, right. Okay. The, the only staff that we have uh, coming to work every day and currently employed is uh, two full-time permanents and our director. So everybody else was reduced. So the LAMS uh, budget? Yes. Is that, we can carry that forward then if we're not using it right now for? We, we can um, assume reimbursement for activities. We're, we're uh, theoretically 100% grant supported Mm -hmm. So if we don't incur cost of employees, we're not asking to be paid for their time. Okay. Do you want to add anything further to that? Um, the Imperial County for Spike Prop 10 Commission um, encourages us to be ready to get back as quickly as we can. The project is dependent upon preschools and daycare centers being open. Mm. Even if they're opened at a reduced rate, they have social distancing, whatever changes they have to make, that is our target audience. There are a few individual places that we might be able to go to, smaller centers, those kinds of things. Um, but until those are up and running, um, the LAMS project basically is on hold. We are funded through a committed grant through June 30th of 21. So for next fiscal year, as soon as we're able to get started, the money is there. Okay. And we've been reassured by the commission that that is in fact true. We still have a few costs incurred with LAMS. The rental, well no, the rental of the building isn't them. There are a few little costs that are involved, but nothing significant. Okay. Marjo, uh, yes. as, it, as it looks like things will reopen, Will there be an opportunity for the, the LAMS employee to kind of come back in and prepare the bus and kind of ramp up? Yes, definitely. We would need to do that. Um, also get books on order. Mm -hmm. Currently we're not ordering, basically not ordering any books for the library. And a lot of that has to do with the warehouse situations. Our major vendors for the kids books are Scholastic and a few other companies. So. Um, once we're ready to gear up, yes, we will definitely need a, at least four to six weeks ahead of time to ramp up for okay. it. But we will also hopefully have an indication from Imperial County Office of Ed and the, the commission that these things are ramping up. This is a target date that we have. Mm -hmm. And we go to having the past gone to centers with as few as six, six kids and as many as 125 at a, wow. at a time, breaking up into smaller groups things. So. That's basically our situation with, with the LAMS. And the commission is very supportive. They've sent correspondence and emails that, yes, they still want to fund us. Um, and it's on a reimbursable basis. So we send quarterly reports, and then we're refunded for the, for the quarters. Okay. And finance does a great job of listing it because they're um, Paperwork requirements are pretty intense sometimes of what they're looking for. They need copies of everything. But as soon as we're ready, we can get back up and going. We've already, the approximately two weeks that they stayed working between March 17th and March 31st, um, worked on having the first two, what we call modules, ready to go. So. When we're ready to go, the craft items are already preset in the little baggies they use. Um, we have the parent <coughs> component that we sent home. Those kinds of things are ready. We won't make the copies till we're ready to go, but we have all of those ready for at least two, two cycles. So they did some, a lot of prep work and cleanup work um, be before they left. Okay. And we call them and they're doing okay, by the way. So. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. More Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, the library kind of illustrates, uh, just as we're going to see on the rec side of our universe, that as the health department has strictly defined what's allowed or not allowed, it's kind of um, had a, it, it's had a significant impact on what facilities we have open and what services we provide. So uh, largely in the library realm, COVID-19 has resulted in a shutdown of um, significant um, days of service. You know, it's a five day a week operation that runs part of the weekend as well. And those activities and offerings are no longer in play. On the rec side, as I'm sure uh, council is acquainted, uh, we placed all of our city leagues on hold. So this, um, at this time of year would have been girls softball, as well as our adult softball league that um, starts up in the summer. And all the leagues that aren't city led or city run, but use our um, city facilities throughout the year, those um, organized play has been also put on hold throughout the city. Our senior center, uh, uh, you may recall that our, we had a vacancy in our senior, senior center uh, coordinator role. We did um, initiate the recruitment, but then placed it on temporary hold till we figure out what the plan is for timing for bringing the senior center back online. And you know, I think today's presentation from Brawley Elementary School District kind of lays out some of those timing expectations. There are certain activities out there that may take longer to bring back online to normal. Uh, what we're seeing as staff is, um, you know, the younger population, school age, that's one kind of large grouping of people that I, I think are pretty dramatically shifting in terms of when uh, what, how long these alternative arrangements are going to be in play. The other place is the senior citizen population. So I, I think that introduces some very, very uh, unique circumstances for us to consider as we program for next year. Um, if this is going to be a particularly fiscally constrained year, which every year is, but this one may be one quite unlike anything we've experienced. Maybe it's a place that uh, we can safely assume the service won't be offered for a certain portion of the year. Uh, any of our Lions Center facilities, meeting spaces, all those things, everything's been placed on hold for use, so we're not um, experiencing any facilities use at this time. Uh, the organizations that we had engaged um, in MOU or uh, different types of short-term lease arrangements, we have not collected um, on monthly uh, amounts and have expressed to those parties that if they're not accessing the service, are using, uh, delivering services inside of our facilities, we aren't charging them for use of the facilities. And then I uh, want to also note that our um, you know, highly valued graffiti abatement efforts in our city, uh, we did move forward with staffing reduction in this area as well as we uh, looked at staff reductions for general fund related activities. So what, what is shown here is with COVID-19, health department changes, this essential versus non-essential, and concern about preserving general fund dollars, we made some dramatic changes um, <coughs> since the emergency declaration. And it will be up to council to tell us what are the things that you'd like to see return to normal uh, and what are the things that given resource constraints, we're just not in a position to, to provide in the next fiscal year. It is so hard to tell at this point. I mean, until we know what, what's gonna happen with restrictions and everything else, it's very difficult to tell. And I already know that our financial position is in bad shape, so. Right. Well, even on a state level, you see, you know, a budget laid out that's going to be completely changed you know that already is in flux mm -hmm. so Correct. there's going to be that here where we're going to put something down on paper and have to go back and change it we are uh, finance has uh, begun its work on the most distressed fund first which is the general fund although Tyler is working on all of our funds the values that we're showing right now in terms of holding constant the services in play We've got a million dollar shortfall, in excess of a million dollars. 
maybe it's not the right time to ask, but has there been any, and, but I'll ask it if I could, um, is there, by the state, maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't, but has there been any consideration from the state of California to allow us to use funds, sources of our funds, like enterprise funds, I've said it before, you know, for, for general purpose expenses? Is there any? We can continue to pursue that question, but as we have discussed it with our uh, consultant, uh, Bardo Wells, the whole uh, format for a special fund is only that purpose. So okay. while we can loan ourselves from one fund to another, the re repayment terms still have to be expressed. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to see if we can work around. In our obviously, so. Have to be expressed. Who, who expresses it? They already have those. We have to be um, uh, audit proof. So, uh, for example, the city uh, provided a loan from the wastewater fund to the water fund many years ago. And there were a lot of reasons for it, but the short of it is that the wastewater fund was doing much better than the water fund, and there wasn't necessarily a desire to raise rates. So the city enter entered into an internal agreement to loan wastewater funds to water. The intention was always payback in a short horizon, but as um, fortune had it, the water fund didn't do well enough to um, have the ability to cover the debt ratios that are necessary, plus carry out the critical capital projects that are needed. Mm -hmm. Therefore, payments didn't start. And several years passed with no payments until an auditor came in and said, you can't just give money from one fund to another, you have to have reasonable payment terms. Mm -hmm. What we ended up doing was structuring a 15-year repayment plan mm -hmm. using LAIF interest rates, which were very, very modest, mm -hmm. and we're now on a 15-year plan to pay ourselves back. Excuse me. So, so when you say it has to be expressed, we... We have an agreement. We, we, we come up with those terms. We come up with it. It's an actual document mm -hmm. that's part of the record. But we can name those terms, and it's not like something that's already preset. You need to pay this back in five years or something. No, it's you know we we tried to come up with something that we could live with. Right. Recognizing that the water fund still to this day is in distress, and there are great needs. On, from the capital point of view, you know we hear updates on our water plant, um, you know twice a month in connection with our emergency projects mm -hmm. because there are needs as the facility ages. There are needs to perform major capital projects. Because we don't have the dollars to program all of it, we end up basically taking them on on an emergency basis one by one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, not to, again, as, as George mentioned, not to jump too far ahead because I think we're going to dive into this in, in subsequent workshop when we really get focused on the budget, but um, maybe a not so restricted fund is is the relinquishment funds um, which I know we've talked about you know on, on multiple occasions for multiple um, reasons um, but in in times like this where we really probably have more questions than answers you know I think as, as Tyler and staff and council as we kind of start going down this budget road um, none of us have a crystal ball other than the fact that I think we're, we're kind of projecting out a, a worst case scenario. <laughs> it's kind of what we're trying, or maybe somewhere in the middle, I, I, I don't know. But because um, uh, some of the things we can't count on are, are what's going to happen federally, state-wise, is there going to be aid, you know, and there's going to be a lot of um, partisan battling over what's being discussed right now of, of potential, you know, state bailouts, et cetera, those types of things. But um, I, I think we need to, we got to look at our strengths and we got to be creative, we got to be innovative. And, and, and I, would, I would assume there are funds like that that aren't actually technically as restricted or really only restricted by our own. The relinquishment funds mm -hmm. are at your disposal as a council. Mm -hmm. um, you have taken some action to frame up what they can be or what they're intended to be used right. for, which was a split between Maine and North 8th Street. Yep. But you certainly are in the driver's seat as a governing body to determine what those funds um, are used for in the future. It's not a state requirement or anything else. It, cities have done all kinds of things with Caltrans relinquishment right. dollars. They've chosen to pay down uh, pension. Yeah, just pointing uh, out, yeah, versus so, the water fund, yeah. wastewater fund, you know, uh, <laughs> discussion. So.
I just had, um, I remember that I think the last audit, one of the auditors mentioned something about use, the use of those funds. Uh, it's because of the labeling of the fund in our accounting system, mm -hmm. not because there's an actual policy that right. restricts its use. So it was just crossing it was the T's and dotting I's, yeah. making sure well, that, we spent a lot of I guess it's just a matter of making sure that there's a clear path of what happened to the money. You'd have to, to move it to a different type of account. Yeah, uh, what you're referring to was, was with the, the two audits ago, VTD mm -hmm. or whatever they're called now, Aid Bailey. Mm -hmm. And they were, cons they did not understand what highway relinquishment funds were. We had to produce the documents with them. In the end, we, uh, we agreed to disagree on the use mm -hmm. uh, of the restricted use of those. This, the auditors with Moss understood it much better and they, they did not have the same concern. Okay. Yeah. I just remember it was mentioned, so I, I wanted to make sure that. And while I'm here, in, in regards to the enterprise funds, uh, uh, this more of a personal opinion uh, with me asking questions to consultants and auditors and what have you. These are unprecedented <laughs> times for sure. In the short term, they, uh, auditors may understand that uh, you know cities have to do some drastic things. Sure. The thing to be concerned with the enterprise funds, though, is we have some debt service ratios with the bonds that we right. owe on those. So mm -hmm. we'd have to be careful on the amounts and what have you. Good point. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Good point. Oh, so am I. No, that's mine. Okay. That was a very surgical approach. There with yes. That <laughs> 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 Okay, so on a going forward basis, obviously great discipline is going to be necessary in 2020, 2021. I, I honestly don't think this is any different from any other year in that regard. But if you think last year was hard, this next year is going to be even more challenging. Um, it is my recommendation that we go through the very, very difficult sorting of what constitutes primary city services versus secondary. I know our vision as a city is to do it all and do it at just about free for, um, from a fee for service point of view. I mean, it, it, um, cost recovery has been something very difficult for us to roll out for a number of reasons, including the perhaps um, the confusion that is generated from what the utility user tax covers as an expense versus a fee and how it gives a uh, kind of a, a long list of possibilities that no fees will ever change, no cost recovery will ever be sought, et cetera. So I, th I think um, that has been a challenge for us as a city to keep pace with uh, the year over year increases in cost uh, with, without other mechanisms to offset the expense. When I refer to primary versus secondary, I'm back on that slide with what are the city's goals. Mm -hmm. Historically, we've said uh, all of these items are important and streets and public safety are a given. Really, when you look at following the money, where we spend the majority of our resources, I think that is an expression of what is our primary purpose and what are our secondary services. I know these are very difficult because we take great pride in um, being a full service city and in um, doing all that we humanly can. Uh, and in the last several years, in order to maintain those service levels, we have uh, vastly relied on the general fund reserve to accomplish it because we were um, we struggled with the trade-offs that were associated with services uh, being eliminated or greatly reduced. So at this point on a going forward basis, it is uh, staff's request that uh, we have your support to continue to go on uh, looking for ways to uh, provide uh, alternatives in the area of primary um, service delivery. Uh, and that uh, we continue to look at options. The COVID-19 really changed up some of how we expected to spend the last three months. Uh, you know, I, to me, it's kind of shocking how we had to reprogram our agency to not just provide essential services, but also modify and adapt to uh, dras drastically different terms. 
quickly um, in a way that allowed us to keep uh, delivering service, but also um, recognizing that the landscape had changed and we had to change with it. Uh, at uh, a prior uh, meeting, uh, the staff, uh, finance, and HR uh, perspectives were shared on some of the issues that we're experiencing as a city in our financial backbone, specifically the software solutions that we rely on in our nerve center at the finance department. Um, I do um, hope to kind of uh, uh, emphasize the placeholder that if we don't address some of these backbone issues, we're going to have um, even more difficult situations ahead. And um, I've gone into a little bit of detail of what that would look like in the next slide. Uh, Flores versus San Gabriel was severely uh, impacted by our finance, uh, 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 financial software not being able to calculate regular rates of pay. Although we have trued up with the majority of our employees, we still have not corrected the system deficiency. Manual calculations are still necessary in order to uh, uh, accomplish uh, proper calculations for rates of pay. And while the cash in lieu of benefit greatly reduced our exposure, we continue to have exposure in this area. So um, although I recognize um, it's uh, a, a bold suggestion that investing in software at this time uh, represents a, a very, very significant dollar value um, to our city. I would be remiss to not take the time to explain what benefits it would bring. Um, and before I provide you with what that uh, price tag is, I'd like to kind of walk you through what I, I see it accomplishing. And this is, of course, the kind of solution that's not a city manager driven uh, process. It's, it's a solution that requires complete integration of our IS staff, finance, and HR. So uh, why, uh, what could we gain from in making such a significant investment at this time? We could actually bring a great deal more of accuracy to hours worked um, using time cards which has not, we have time sheets that get filled out, very, very paper and manually oriented. Uh, the use of electronic systems create different types of accountability that have, um, I think, great value for an organization of our size in excess of 100 people. Uh, we would have the chance to, to better configure for the future. We have an HR and risk management department of one as all of you know, um, in Shirley's recent absence, uh, we felt the great pain of an incredible workload that Shirley carries on her own that uh, some of us absorbed uh, for her time away. And it always just gives me great appreciation for the volume of work and also just how much uh, hinges on the presence of a single, uh, single person. I think as we position for succession planning and uh, uh, the best chance at a strong organization. Uh, having a software solution that takes on a lot of these HR topics that today are literally an appointment by appointment basis are the way uh, we bring people um, into our employment and we annually uh, process benefit elections. Uh, this would give us a way to integrate all of our systems with all departments and there are additional features that I think are of great value when you look at our development um, activities that cross over between building, planning, and public works. So you'll see some of the suggestions that integration um, you know, could, it, could uh, offset the type of leakage that sometimes occurs with lapses in communication. We'd have a lot more uh, ability for the financial management duties that are tied to every single director citywide 
to it, right now the system solely runs through finance. If you have a finance question, get in line because you're gonna you're gonna need to address it to to either Tyler or Tony and wait for you. You don't have a way to access that information as a department in and of yourself. You only by making a request, which makes us just a very manually mm -hmm. yeah. dependent organization. Should have seen when you know back in two thousand seven two thousand eight. <laughs> I, uh, when, uh, when I describe it, it's not to say that we're bad or no, no. that we're, yeah, it's but just, it's evolution, it's, it's, right? It's just a manual system. It's just, even the software that we use, our finance software, you know, that's old software, you know, and so it's just, it's just a manual system. So we have over, what is our total number of accounts? 50? Uh, UB. Okay, so 5,800 accounts. <laughs> we, we often manually stuff. Yeah. when our stuffing machine is not, our yeah. folding and stuffing machine are not working. While we'd love to email bills to that, there is a growing number, although COVID has also taught us, last week we processed, <laughs> how many customers? Oh, on, on, on Friday? On Friday it was 172 customers. Hot day, willing to stand in line. Wow. I mean, think about it. At the a window. The ability to be able to text somebody, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all those things, it's like, it, it yeah. has to. You just have to evolve to that. It has to be that. This is like, unfortunately, the perfect storm of all the things that could go wrong in order to identify your weaknesses. And that's, you know, that's it. Right and, there. and the unfortunate part on this is the sol we, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of the current software oh, yeah, solution. That's well beyond the volume of how many utility billing customers are typical of the solution. It's like the, the solution for under a thousand. Mm. Well, remember when we tried to change uh, business licenses? It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. From an implementation point of view. And so we yeah. went back to the old, you know. Cards. And then the stamp it and, you know, here, <laughs> here you got your 49 bucks. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Come on. Like, you know what I mean? I think like, it's time for sure. It is, but I haven't told you the price yet. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was digging through my emails. To, I, I didn't print my notes here, so I do apologize for that. Um, so, you know, we could give our, uh, you may recall, because some of you were the champions of this cause, bringing on the credit card processing option um, and online tracking of certain consumption, we'd be able to, to roll out a whole lot more of um, electronic access to customers, better understanding yeah. um, how they can manage resources. As well as data on their water usage. Yeah. So um, more than anything, you know, I, I we brought this up in past years, but I think we've spent more time in a working group identifying um, the benefits and what some of the options are out there in the marketplace. If it's not this year, we hope that there is a time in the future that this can be prioritized to bring um, our city operations into the 21st century. Um, our first year costs are in the range of 175,000 to 200,000. And um, something like this would not, would take a whole year to go live. So it's not like it's, um, it's make a decision and hit go. Um, it's a process. Um, what, what about like if we were to move forward with that? Obviously, there has to be staff training and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Is that part of that learning process? I'm sure you can structure your yeah. package depending yeah. on how much you want to pay, yeah. right? But, uh, okay. This was, uh, of course, it was all before pre-COVID that I was talking to. Okay. Week Sorry, yeah. weekly, but uh, yeah, that, that the first year cost includes training uh, uh, and also a test environment to make sure we, we'd, we'd, we'd uh -huh. be working simultaneously at least a quarter, three yeah. months, if not longer, to make sure that yeah. everything's worked before we go live. It's like a painful getting started, and then once it works, it's just... Yes, it saves yeah. money, uh -huh. saves it's, time. It's, it's a pain up front, no matter what, yeah. any, any new process or any new... Uh, thing you do, it's it's up front is the learning curve is. Yeah. But, yeah. And how how does that how does that cost decrease over time? If it's it 175 is, or 200 the yeah, first year, uh, it's about seven. It's this is this is the uh, cloud the SaaS mm -hmm. system that I'm referring to. It's about 71,000 to 80,000 a year annually after that for okay. for service and support, which includes storage of the, of the uh, 
uh, software and the data. Does it, is this sort of a, um, oh, I don't, an evolving type of, of uh, program or software where new, um, updates, new, new, yeah, updates and, and methods are integrated over the years so you're never having to have this hard reset? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the, another benefit of being in the cloud versus on your system. Uh, it includes the updates. Uh, any anything that is uh, implemented that was that wasn't in there is part mm -hmm. of the package. Okay. And everybody's on the same. And then yes. people are learning as they go too yeah. with the newer, newer newer things that come up. Yeah. Good. I think what we're looking at is in, as Rosanna was talking about, um, you know, service levels changing or people's perceptions of what everything costs, how it how it increases every year, uh, and 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 also with a, a finance software. I think it's this is a time and probably an opportunity for a hard reset on a lot of this stuff that's just it's it's going to be hard anyway and it's like we might as well do all the hard things that we can at once so that maybe we can have a series of years that are not so hard in the future and not as costly you know if if we're saving time and money i i can't imagine you know all this stuff by hand how much time is going to be saved for half hours right i mean right. that it, when you start to look at salaries that may be you know what i mean yeah it, it starts to make sense i mean there's already an expense to what we do now right, right? yeah there and is so, and we uh -huh. did do staff reductions yeah. through the years in finance with the hopes of trying yeah. to realize some efficiencies but the intensity and the manual work is still so time consuming yeah. and when, you, when you start to look at the actual dollars uh -huh. the cost uh -huh. right it may be a lot less expensive than, than the figure that's being presented mm -hmm. because when you start to really consider staff time and everything else, it may be a lot mm -hmm. less. And remember, this dollar value wouldn't necessarily be borne 100% by the general fund. A portion of it would be general fund, and a portion would be water, sewer, and other or, special funds. Or all of this next fiscal year either. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if we were to look back, if we had had a system like this in place when this case came up I mean imagine we yeah we wouldn't have we the same have had all we the would have paid issues. it paid paid it without damages right mm. so wow. yeah there in itself wow. you can tell how much savings there would have been mm -hmm. it's not to say that rolling this out would not involve a massive well, culture change <laughs> because it, it it really is a different animal when you're using um, uh, time clocks mm -hmm. but the accuracy too the accuracy mm -hmm. is, is, is there when you have a system a lot of resistance and internal and we have a similar san gabriel mm -hmm. issue with, uh, with the uh, the new lead as far as regular rate of pay that the, the uh, government has said that employees are access, uh, available to use so that is is similar to san gabriel as a cash in lieu where that is going to be have to calculate it into the regular rate of pay as far as overtime goes correct Shirley? Everybody's looking like they're yeah. mm -hmm. like, uh -oh. my world. <laughs> you better explain that. You can't one. see our facial expression. I don't have the ears for these things. <laughs> oh, sorry. So with um, the CARES Act and everything the our president has signed into law, mm -hmm. one of those things is an amended Family Medical Leave Act. So it's Families First Coronavirus leave act and what it does it provides two-thirds if you need to stay home and take care of your child because the school's out you can get this amended fmla have up to 12 weeks of time and get two-thirds of your pay you could supplement the rest of that pay with your leave banks mm. and it kicks on on day 11. so what the federal government's now saying is that rate of pay we have to figure it out. And it's not the same way as the regular rate of pay that FLSA has. So that's what Tyler's saying, that the software is gonna be able to do that for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Yes, so you definitely need a system in place to do that. I can just see you trying to figure that out um, by hand. <laughs> yeah, it is a definitely um, a, a time intensive uh, process. So really do appreciate the chance to have dialogue with you on this topic um, and uh, hope to revisit it in, in future uh, discussion pieces before the council. Okay. Okay, so for today, 
um, we're really hoping to receive some some direction from the council. Um, I don't think I'd be doing my job if I did not suggest that uh, we need to put into play a strategy to get our reserve built back up. I think the, the pandemic is kind of the perfect example of um, why we, we want to have a rainy day fund. I think we're doing our best this fiscal year to kind of preserve as many resources as possible to try our best to end the year um, in a, a manner that we have a good shot for some form of reimbursement and that uh, the, the costs in excess that we're incurring outside of the budget process are as minimal as they can be. We've been very, very, I think, thoughtful and frugal. Our department heads have done a remarkable job coming up with uh, responsible solutions, how to manage risk in the workplace um, relative to COVID that have not been huge numbers um, where we've engaged tons of outside vendors. We've, I think, pulled together in a, a pretty remarkable way to try to keep our workplace uh, safe. Um, I would like to, to, to also just take a moment to talk through a little bit of what um, uh, our Brawley Elementary School District reported today, the notion of um, hiring freeze versus layoffs. As we move this discussion forward for 2020-21, you're going to see a significant gap in some of our funds between revenues and expenditures if we stay in the same form. That really pushes the envelope on the question of, do we need to think surgically about what we can live without as secondary services for now? Or do we take the hiring freeze approach? The downside of the hiring freeze approach is it rarely occurs in places that there aren't incredible need. So there are definite trade-offs to, to kind of the nameless, faceless, vacant slot yeah. versus Being and just going the service that has importance and value to the community, but we simply can't afford at this time. Doesn't mean that the city isn't committed to bringing it back at a future date, prioritizing reintegration if certain parameters are met. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that this, the city council can establish a framework that's a placeholder for those activities to resume in the future. Uh, I think we tried this fiscal year to implement cost recovery. We all kind of have, um, I, you know, a, some maybe had some difficult conversations on the, the rec league fronts, on the pull user groups, all those that were just so, so challenging. And it's because our culture has been do as much as you can for um, free if possible because it's a community value which is awesome you know our parks and recreation programs have been the great mixing pot for all kinds of households to have kids yeah. recreate and adults recreate and that's kind of like the, the great mutual benefit of low-cost access is that it's for everybody um, but moving towards cost recovery whether it's field lights which we've never done or it's greater cost recovery on any number of fronts. This fiscal year, we said we can't afford to do X, Y, and Z leagues at the end of the year. We have no more monies to rely on from the general fund perspective, a reserve perspective to, to bring them online. It forced the envelope and created some very challenging um, discussion topics for stakeholder groups. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, we got community support eventually to, to bring them back online. Unfortunately, COVID mm -hmm. kind of uh, reversed all, all those activities. All, all, all that work, all that negotiation. No <laughs> yeah. And we did issue refunds for all community contributions made. That's I'm sorry, Luke, did you have yeah. a So you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, primary versus secondary services. and. I just wonder if that approach that we took with with the rec leagues, you know, if that's something that we need to consider doing is telling people these will go away for now. And I think I, my hope is that people will be more understanding because of COVID, understanding that everyone is making a sacrifice and the municipal level is going to be no different. 
but that you know if if we have more community support financially if it's available then we can reinstate some of these services but um, as I said before it's going to be a hard reset there's just <laughs> there are facts that you can't bend or reshape mm -hmm. to your desires as much as we all want to going along with that uh, Luke I think it's also important to consider the fact that it's not just about maybe reduction or elimination of certain activities or departments or whatever it is right mm -hmm. but it's also we're not really sure what the future holds right you know it's even just really reopening decision to make, you know because we're not sure exactly how we're going to be operating in three months right you know? you're not different and you're not yeah. going to know because there's unknowns. yeah, yeah it, it, it's we're, we're probably it, you know we need to almost this discussion not not in this one but the whole budget process is going to have to be consistent consistent with the declaration of the emergency right. these are these are very extraordinary times of which I know if everyone hears that again, they're going <laughs> to knock someone in the Still head. Say but, unprecedented. Um, they are <laughs> uh, unprecedented times. But Uncertain. I, I think it bears uh, as a community to protect ourselves that we need to make some unprecedented decisions, yeah. which are going to be difficult decisions. But I, I think as our city manager framed it, primary being, yes. I, I, I would, if I were a business and I had to reopen, this is my core business, and I would identify those things, whatever they are, you know, public safety, et cetera, water has water, to wastewater. be clean, right? I mean, Here are my core like services. Right. This is primary. We're going to do everything we can to protect the delivery of these services. Everything else, which used to live in that primary universe, may be obviously, uh, you know, kind of relabeled to get us through these difficult times. I think that'd be the prudent thing to do, and I can't imagine um, anybody in the public would, would, would see that as you know, irresponsible in some way. I would think it's incumbent upon us to try to make those decisions. And then I think, as, as we're all saying, if, 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 if we overshot, and and we can bring these services back we'd be the first to do a, it and a budget yeah. adjustment basis right. we're, to, we're one yeah. meeting away yeah. to make that happen yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. keeping it fluid yeah. which Good is how point. it's going to be everywhere yeah. and i do like that you framed up like primary and secondary i've made my own list yeah. um that i won't share right now but it, but it's true i mean what luke and, and donnie are both saying is like if we do overreach on something and say hey i mean there, we can always reintroduce well, but it's kind of a, if there's any, the if, if yeah. there's anything that COVID-19 taught us as a lesson, it was what do we really value so much that we're going to maintain absolute continuous operation of. I want to be able to flush the toilet. That's, that's yeah. <laughs> number one. True. Yeah. Right. Right. Running water. Number two. We need running water. Uh, so not running water. You know, there's certain things that we need Crash to be collected. able to do. Yeah. Right. And right. So, and I, you know, I think modifying the way we provided the service was also critically important. Whether you know, in the end, it'll wash out whether we ended up spending more or spending less, because by delivering less activity, we're reducing costs. Mm -hmm. It was no easy decision to do the staff reductions, even though yeah. we didn't, because we didn't have a real sense of. Is it going to be back next month? Right. Are we going to lose and, all this talent? And Rosanna, I know the past of the past, it's difficult. I, I don't, I'm not expecting us to live there, but I, I always recap during this time of year. A couple of unfortunate cir circumstances could, would quickly either replace a couple million dollars that could be sitting in the reserve fund right now. So it, it's, it, it, there, there's, a, there's a part of this that's, I think, you know, Luke's gone there, most of council, George has mentioned this. Um, you know, if, if the ball kind of bounces in your favor and you don't have these unexpected, either unfunded mandates or costs or, you know, litigation issues um, because a, a, a court ruling or something of that nature, um, you'd, you'd have a completely different outlook. It doesn't mean they wouldn't still be extraordinary times, but. Um, I think that's a lot of what we've been able to absorb. It speaks to, um, I think the city's, you know, we've, we've been pretty resilient, you know, and I think our, our, our conservative approach has allowed us to even be having this conversation, you know, that we're going to be having. So I, I think our approach has always been, look, it is conservative, but we're always, you know, planning for the future. And to some, to some extent, as much as we can't predict, um, predict what that's going to be, um, I think we've always been 
pretty reasonable in their approach in providing all we can to the community. And that's the only thing I'll say about these services you're talking about. Every single one of them are an investment in, in, in the quality of life right here in, right. Here in Brawley. So um, I, I don't think any of us regret providing the best of services we can and in the, uh, in the decisions we've made in the past, while at the same time dealing with these unexpected, who would ever sit there and plan for a San Gabriel, you know, so who knows how that turns out, or, you know, cost of goods, cost of labor, cost of, you know, those type of things. So um, I think we just, we, we've got to tighten up and we've got to be creative, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and expecting we're going to have access to funds that otherwise we would not consider in buttressing our, our decisions with, with, with the general fund. So it's just going back to whether, you know, as George mentioned, whether it's, you know, uh, getting some relief uh, potentially from the state on enterprise fund or restricted funds or funds that we thought we were going to do, you know, some capital projects with. But right now, it, it's really about getting from A to B, right? And, and that should make this discussion a little bit easier, I hope. It's just a tough decision for us. Yeah. Yeah. So one strategy, this is just one. It does not mean it's the one um, or that it's necessarily a recommendation at this time. We could stay as we are with parks and rec and library activities on hold, very uh, limited rec programming, very limited library uh, service uh, staffing, and just assume that's the case through December 2020. By doing so, we can, uh, and this is using the framework of primary and secondary. Mm -hmm. It'll be up to the council to decide what uh, you are willing to accept on a short-term basis, but this is just one type of alternative that's out there. Um, I touched on in city manager comments some of the recovery resources. Um, they're not entirely flexible, you know, as I uh, shared we'll have to propose eligible activities that are hopefully general enough that they're valuable um, as $134,000, uh, uh, but are still consistent with the principles for, for uh, the designation of the funds. Excuse me. Uh, I wanted to also note, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the utility user tax and its potential presence on the ballot. Uh, we, in the last 12 months, have also heard discussions out in the community. I don't know that this is the best time, but I don't want to allow the conversation to close without a mention of it. We've talked in the past about a sales tax. We've talked uh, with the Chamber of Commerce in this venue about a TOT tax. I'm not advocating for taxes. That's not w what the point of me raising it. It's to simply note 2020, is a ballot that's coming and some decisions are going to be before the council in the coming months because of the deadlines for getting the language in. Mm -hmm. uh, some decisions will have to be made about whether those measures are going to be pursued uh, in this next election cycle. I will also note there was, there's been a placeholder through the years about the city clerk role, specifically whether in the future it will become an appointed role that's another item that could be taken up on, on the ballot. The city took on that topic with the city treasurer, and that's how it eventually converted into an appointed role. That may be something that uh, the body wishes to consider as we modernize our uh, activities as an organization going forward. Yes. Was, was that something that was on the ballot in 2017? A, a, a Changing what the was clerk to a, an appointed position? You remember correctly, and I actually pulled the language because I was having a little bit of memory loss on the details of it. What happened is three of the city council positions and one council member all were in the uh, odd-numbered year. Mm -hmm. And so it had to roll it to an even number year because of the state law change that municipal elections have to be at the same time mm -hmm. as general elections. So yes, it was on the ballot at that time, and it was uh, getting it synchronized to an even year. Okay, it, but it was not, it did not have to do with transferring from an elected position to an appointed. We brought it up because it, it basically every election cycle. I think you misheard this question. What was on the ballot was changing treasurer to appointed. Yes. Clerk has not been on the ballot. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It has not been on the ballot, but it's dis been discussed yeah. for several election cycles. I think the mass, okay. I think I heard the question was city clerk on the ballot. Right, yeah, that is what I asked. Because I, for some reason, recall having seen this on a ballot before, I but, think but, but just treasurer. treasurer. I don't remember. Not appointment. No. no. It was a treasurer. In 17, it was the treasurer. The treasurer. Changing the date, synchronizing the yeah, date. But it, um, yeah. it says, um, pursuant to the requirements of laws of the state of California relating to general law cities, there is called an order to be held in the city of Brawley on Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015, a general municipal election for the purpose of electing three members of the city council for full terms of four years and a city clerk for full term of four years and a city treasurer for a full t that This was the 2015 action item. Huh. So it doesn't call it five years for some reason. That's strange. No, uh, no well, because it was, we had to election for 2017. No. The 2015, our terms were up in 2019 mm -hmm. last year. Right. But due to, we were going to even years. Yeah. So the three council members that are due this year and the city clerk, but not yeah. by not on the ballot that's interesting because I think in 2017 they actually were on the ballot as a five-year term no 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 four year four year 21 yeah, I'd have to no, retrace 20. our staff reports because I, I recall that we had yeah. to prepare uh, action items relative so to the law change 2017 is till 20 Everybody got a year. Right, yeah. Extra year. I just seem to recall that in, in Sam's in my election year that it, it actually said on the ballot it was a five-year term because of, oh. yes, because uh, of that. Because of, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. But in yeah, 15, yeah, it didn't right. call it. Uh -huh. So yours, your terms are up on 20, 2022. Right, yeah. Oh. But and in ours, 2015. We got an additional year because we were going to even, which is 2020. Yeah. But it doesn't call that out on the ballot, though. No, yeah. because at that time. For, for, for your, you and Sam, when you were elected, it, the way I remember it, because I had to write it, and I, I could go look, I have it, but I think yours did say it was going to be for five years yes. mm -hmm. because of that change mm -hmm. in state law. And then we had to do an ordinance to extend the okay. sitting council yes. member. Yeah, yeah that was an ordinance for ours. Their term would be up in no election. Right, yeah. So it was, kind of, it was unprecedented. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. if you look closely, it says because of COVID. Does it already back then? <laughs> we, we knew COVID was going on. Right. Yeah. Because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that you were in the next yeah. 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 Yep. So um, <laughs> at the next council meeting, first meeting in June, the current plan is to combine the general fund and the special and enterprise funds into a workshop discussion. Because the general funds, um, Probably the most difficult trade-offs involved our current plan is to have that be more heavily discussion-based, whereas the special and enterprise funds will be more oriented towards capital projects. Refreshing what uh, we plan on uh, pre-plan for capital projects and what uh, we're hoping to accomplish in a 12-month window. And then uh, if, if that goes uh, as planned, We'll simply use the second meeting date in June to have a final budget before uh, the city council. Okay. So we're not looking at doing a, we, we already discussed this, we're not doing a special meeting next week, right? It's just gonna be a long meeting. Not at this long. time. We've got the, the updated schedule. We're certainly here to work with the council in whatever format um, you wish. For the general fund discussion, I imagine that'll be the most challenging uh, the, the sorting process. That, that That's the one for 9 a.m. on the... Meeting. Yeah. That was the June 2nd. Yeah. June 2nd mm -hmm. at 9 a.m. And then 6 Yeah. I mean... Um, what what uh, the council may find is it's uh, you need another day or have uh, you need you need a little bit more time to work through mm -hmm. those decisions and we're certainly available to work with you on, on whatever you need okay. to get there. It's all going to be fluid. Is there any mm -hmm. other feedback you'd like us to keep as mo in mind as we prep well, content? I'm, I mean, I think it's somewhat unrealistic for us to think about the uh, uh, building up the reserve when we're in a COVID type situation where we don't really even know what our revenues are going to look like from sales tax, et cetera, business failure, all that type of thing. 
I think when we talk about building up reserves, I think we have to be in a different position. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I think if we talk about building reserves, I know people would think we were ridiculous because it just doesn't. It doesn't mean it has to be an aggressive plan. It could no. be, for instance, a strategy that says uh, we're not going to adopt a budget with any use of general fund reserve this year and next year. The, the body agrees to and uh, grow it by some modest percentage. Tim, or all I would say to yeah. that too, it's kind of like a household budget. If you have some forced savings, you can, uh, like I always say at home, you can always use it if yeah, you need to. That's what it's there that, for. So any yeah. savings that we have, we will yeah. put into uh, reserve. But yeah. are we going to have any savings? I don't anticipate. Uh, the only way we're going to have savings is with cuts. Right, or, or influx of money in some way. If we get money Ongoing back. revenues. There's, there's <laughs> that's something not that time. comes in from the state or some right. sort of assistance, mm -hmm. but even then it's yeah, not. Yeah, we we're, we're not really counting on, it doesn't really sound count like. On, on that money. If, yeah. And it may be too early to discuss this, but if if you were to, uh, as, you, as you talked about before with the parks and rec and library activities, um, put those on hold, is there a, does there look to be a significant, um, savings to be had from that or is that is that going to be kind of pulled away to other yeah if you we can prepare numbers for you the big thing that it would result in is dramatic shifts in if cattle call were to proceed uh, that that is a, a very significant sum of dollars mm -hmm. uh, that we devote to, to supporting signature events that are really important to Brawley yeah. so Maybe that gets carved out in one fashion, so you get to see that number. The other league-related dimensions get. You can bandanas. Maybe we can raise money like that. There you go. I think we need. I think you need right. to tell, uh, show us. Okay, how much money are we saving by with mm -hmm. the reductions in the yeah. library, and then how much Absolutely. money do would we really ex expect to spend with a cattle call events? Mm -hmm. Because I think every year we spend it. But we haven't. We don't really say, "Oh, okay, we're going to spend that much money." We just know it's an yeah. event that we're going to put on. But I think realistically, we need to actually look at the number. And Let's remember, see. on the parks and rec side, right now we're continuing to operate with our hybrid model of permanent staffing for facilities maintenance mm -hmm. or, or parks maintenance mm -hmm. and augmentation with uh, temporary workers. In addition to that, that's how we keep the team comprised. So there are some other ways to structure it. There's the go forward, keep it the same. There's the reduce the staffing, see what the numbers gain you from a reduction of temporary salaries. It's not a ton. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say our number last year was 26,000 oh per full-time temp. But it, so we'll, we'll get that information for you so that the general fund workshop has all those dimensions, which if, if, uh, council's in agreement that you want the greatest detail provided on that front. That'll be our focus as staff is to get that content. Like my question would be like, okay, we have the parks on Rick and you have the temps working right now. Mm -hmm. So if we were to look at not having the temps, what work would not get done? Uh, maintenance. Right. And lots I mean, and lots of what maintenance. Is that? I mean, $52,000 this fiscal year. What it would be next, we'd have to look at other rising costs. Every year, the, the cost of the model. I'm just asking the question, Sam. Yeah. Don't give me a dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> if, if any yeah. of you wish to have specific questions I, I, yeah, ready I mean for our answers to questions, mm -hmm. we're happy to work with you because, on that. Because, I mean, like, as you you know exactly what would go away, and I, I don't. So if, if you tell me this is not going to get done, and then it'll I'll, be I'll, very I'll visible. Say, okay, then for that's that. why they're considered Forget essential that today. Yeah. That, that has been. We probably can't do it. I mean, but I, you know, mm -hmm. it's a question that we, unless you work with it all the time, I don't we know. We also augmented, just so folks know, because we're um, delayed in doing the CFD outsourcing, mm -hmm. we oh, yeah. brought on two people, um, f additional temps. That one of them is paid by CFDs, only working on CFD landscape areas only. The other person only does right-of-way work because it's right-of-way funded. So those were two additional bodies that were added this fiscal year using special funds, not the general fund. Okay. And if you still see weeds, which I think all of us do, yes. <laughs> it's a function of even with those additional folks, it's just not enough hands. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. Okay.
And with that, I, uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Presenter, was, there, was that in that, but the expectations are pretty set for the next discussion in terms of we understand. So we're in, we're in emergency mode and, okay. Yeah, because the other thing to our advantage, we just went through that six months ago and, and had to make some difficult decisions there. So I think we've been through the right. the exercise. Now it's you know, going to be yeah. And I also think round. in our favor is that I, I just I think the community has to be of an understanding at this point that things are going to dramatically change, yeah. not for the better, at, and at least for this this fiscal year, this new fiscal year. They I, I'm sure that most people, if they have watch the news at all or if they have any understanding of even personal finance know that it's not going to be the kind of year that we normally have yeah and that's true but I, I would think that it, 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 I wouldn't say it's not for the better I would just say it's more focused on the essentials mm -hmm. you know and so yeah. I think if we keep that mentality it's going to be easier mm -hmm. for us or staff for the public to really yeah. accept you know because they're all I mean there's a bunch of things that we would like to be able to provide sure. But um, if we can at the moment, it's not to say they won't come back. Right. Yeah. You know, so I, I would just frame it that way. It's it's um, not that it's for the worse. It's just for the betterment of the city. Yeah. You know. To get I us think. through. Yeah, to get us through. I think. Yeah, and in the un in the unlikely event that some windfall happens from the state or from the federal government, as Donnie said, you know, if you've got it, then you have the opportunity to use it later. Mm -hmm. But. If we plan for the worst or expect the worst and, and hope for the best, then that's probably a more realistic yeah. tack. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot of practice at resilience as mm -hmm. an organization. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, um, hopefully have better days ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Rosanna. You're welcome. Thank I guess you. we'll go ahead Thank and you, uh, go into closed session. I'll give everybody a, a few minutes to. No. That's not good. Yeah. Regroup. I'm guessing it's not good. Thank you, everybody. What? That's here.